So this afternoon, for something perhaps a little different, we're going to hear some original work, some original research that has been supported, sponsored by the Canadian Frailty Network. Uh, we've picked four things that we think are particularly relevant and germane uh, to rural remote Canada and to the north, and we'll hear from those in a moment. If you have not, as of yet, signed up for the breakout sessions tomorrow, would you please do that? Because we need to basically divide ourselves into groups, uh, four groups for tomorrow's session. Um, we, you will recall that before uh, lunch, we did have a bit of commentary about um, MPs and senators and political influence. It's certainly the intention of the Canadian Frailty Network to pursue that agenda, both provincially and federally. Uh, we'll, we'll have to plot whether or not we have a second visit back to visit some of those key people once they're in place in the new year. But we want to maintain this now in the political eye. Well, why it may be true it wasn't on the last election agenda, it doesn't mean that it's not important, and we want to keep it on their agenda. You might see some of these out at the front desk. These are postcards. They're all ready to go. They have interesting messages on them. We produced a bunch of these um, postcards in the Canadian Frailty Network. Um, if you are so inclined, um, grab a handful as on your way out um, and uh, write your local uh, MP, uh, MLA, but particularly at a federal level. We're trying to have uh, influence at the national level here uh, MPs, senators, and whatnot, uh, now that we know who they are, send them a postcard and give them my love. Um, so again, sign up for breakouts. And uh, now, for this session this afternoon, we have four wonderful presentations. And the, the four uh, speakers I'll introduce individually in just a moment, but this is the essence of the things that Canadian Frailty Network has been supporting for the last seven years. We've had scores of very interesting research projects and KT activities, but these four, in our mind, stand out. And they, they stand out because of their relevance to us, uh, notwithstanding the quality of the work itself. And the first one that we're going to have um, is Annette Garm. And uh, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, Annette before when she presented the Canadian Frailty Network's uh, National Symposium this year. Um, and she is Fraser Health's executive lead for community actions and resources empowering seniors, otherwise known as CARES, Community Actions and Resources Empowering Seniors, otherwise CARES. CARES uses a comprehensive geriatric assessment to identify seniors who are mostly at risk of frailty. So pick out the potential uh, individuals that have frailty or are at risk. And once the senior is aware of that risk, um, through the CARES program, they're partnered. They're partnered with, um, with a free telephone health coach, and that comes from Self Management BC. And that coach helps that individual, who has been simply determined through screening to need that help, to get that help to develop healthy behaviors and access resources to keep them independent. So Annette comes to this uh, with uh, a couple of master's degrees, actually, one certainly in liberal arts and, and uh, her calling in nursing as well, and, and holds an advanced certification in gerontology and is a fellow of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement's Executive Training in Research Program, otherwise known as EXTRA, that some of you will know. So I think this one really has something to say to us. Listen carefully. Here's Annette. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that introduction, Tom. It is a real pleasure to be up here in the north um, today and to share a common interest that I hold with all of you, and that is frailty. So we, um, we really, uh, shall I say, uh, drank the Kool-Aid in that we really believed, um, after studying at length, what the evidence that we were seeing around frailty um, that it could be prevented, it could be um, best prevented by looking at uh, evidence-based tools in primary care. And we really wanted to look at uh, the social prescribing components of, um, of uh, 
or social determinants of frailty too. So here you have my learning objectives. Uh, um, you've seen them. Uh, I don't need to uh, def uh, review those with you. And also, you know, I have to laugh because I feel the two gentlemen, Dr. Muscadieri and Dr. Noseworthy, have pretty much told you about my presentation. So I, I can just sit down because, you know, I was going to define frailty, but that's been done. So um, let me just uh, review a little bit of um, what I really want to, um, you know, confirm for you is that our intervention is located in evidence based practices as we understand them. And, and um, so to that end, we were. The the, our challenge is uh, looking at frailty, and I think Dr. Muscadiri has done a very good job at defining frailty. I think what's of particular interest in my um, uh, frailty definition, that, that's not different from, but I want to emphasize is really the social determinants of um, the social deficits. We, we're great believers that frailty is an accumulation of health and social deficits, and that the real uh, risk factors uh, the real social risk factors, I should say, for frailty are social isolation and poverty. That's already been that's already been discussed. So again, what's already been discussed is that by 2030, one in four of us will be uh, over 65, and then we know that the impact of frailty is quite severe to people, and really has the ability to change people's lives in a way that promotes suffering in the last 10 years. Um, of their lives, and, and uh, our efforts are really intended to address that, to, to address the impact of frailty on the person, and I know uh, Dr. Muscadiri had reviewed some of this data, so um, uh, I will just move into the discussion that uh, we really got very interested into, or the point, is really um, the question is, can frailty be prevented, delayed, or improved? And so as clinicians and um, healthcare providers in Fraser Health, we look to the evidence. And we, that's what we did when we were working um, with the Canadian Foundation Healthcare, um, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement in Ottawa, when I did the extra, the executive training and research application project. So we looked at data. And of course, the data seems to indicate, or the research seems to indicate, that there is hope. There is hope for us to prevent or delay frailty or even improve it. And primarily, if you want to look at what the research tells us, is periodic comprehensive geriatric assessments are associated with, for, with better health outcomes for older adults at risk for frailty. And the evidence to that is huge. The other piece that we looked at is that augmenting health assessment findings um, really, geriatric assessments are really intended to inform care planning. What's the point of assessing if we don't do something with that knowledge, correct? And so to that end, um, the purpose of the health assessment is really to establish a collaborative care plan. Then we, we really were aware, as in speaking with many physicians, physicians are so busy, especially in primary care, um, that <coughs> social risk factors can't really be addressed in the in the. Um, physician's office. And so to that end, we looked uh, to models in the UK, and many of you um, people may be f familiar with the whole efforts coming out of the UK to address social isolation. And, and to that end, we looked at their social prescribing model. And what we were able to secure is funding to um, get social prescribing in, uh, to align with our project. And social prescribing, just to really um, summarize that, what that is, is it, it is it provides the nurse practitioner or the GP the opportunity to write a prescription for the older adult and say, here, go see this social prescriber. And in our project, that person the title of that person is the Seniors Community Connector. And that's the person who's really to address the um, social risk factors. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as I move through. But fundamentally, what we also really saw, and I really believe, um, and we know that we've already heard this evidence spoken to, is that primary care providers are ideally situated to incorporate proactive and best practices in their clinical work, especially if they are working in primary care teams. 
So again, when we're looking at our particular project and when we were looking at the data that informed us, we were looking at, you know, who do people sometimes ask me, well, who, who's at risk for frailty? So we use the clinical frailty scale. Coming to the clinical frailty scale, um, these are the, the factors that we really consider, obviously, chronic diseases, polypharmacy, um, social isolation, weight loss, all of the indicators. That, but here is the clinical frailty scale. If you are not familiar with this particular scale, it was developed by Kenneth Rockwood, who's at the University of Dalhousie. He's Canada's leading uh, researcher in frailty, and practically, I would say, one of um, he's one of the best international researchers, or certainly one of the most published, um, and he informed also the UK's fit for frailty, along as uh, the other, my other research partner. Uh, so Dr. Rockwood is my research partner, as is Dr. Jawai Song, and Dr. Song has also done tremendous research in the area of frailty and informed the UK's uh, fit for uh, frail. Uh, initiative. So we tried to align what we were doing with what was coming out of the literature, with what the researchers were doing, and we were fortunate enough to become their research partners. And then to that end, in my particular work that I do, we target people four to six. So we really believe that our best opportunities are those folks who are at, uh, at you know, early to moderate risk. And then we have, then for those folks who are at that risk, so um, we then look at the comprehensive geriatric assessment. And we see the, uh, the, I mean, if you've ever worked with, or if you have the opportunity to work with Dr. Rockwood, he will tell you it's the gold standard. And to that point, um, we really have, like I said, I drank the Kool-Aid. I believe that the CGA is the gold standard, particularly because it can generate a frailty index. But I'll speak to you a little bit about that later. But the CGA is defined as a diagnostic and treatment process that identifies medical, psychosocial, and functional limitations of a frail older person in order to develop a coordinated plan. That's really the very essence of the value of this comprehensive geriatric assessment. Now, people think I just flashed up an eye chart, and it's not an eye chart. It is the CGA. There are 70 variables that need to be looked at um, by the primary care providers. And, um, and then uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we've done, but you will see um, in that we have Put it in an electronic form that generates the frailty index. That's kind of the, the place I will get to. But let's just start with looking at the, um, the value of this CGA. And the value is really, um, you'll see it's such a comprehensive assessment from cognition. If we're looking, if our worry is, um, can, we're worried about dementia or early cognitive decline. Um, we're looking at motivation. We're looking at depression, um, mental health. We're looking at sleep. We're looking at immunization. We're looking at activities. We're looking at, you know, strength. You can see that if you start to go down it, it's very comprehensive. And if you really do want to get a snapshot of where the at-risk senior is in that moment, this is one of the most evidence-based tools to say that this has it all. Um, and and uh, hence why we have used it in our particular project. But as I said, the benefit, the real benefit of doing the CGA is it's used to capture the relevant information about the collective health status and functional ability of an older person. And that, it also facilitates, obviously, the accurate diagnosis, the holistic management, and the effective communication and care planning within a multidisciplinary team. And I would now add, in collaboration with our older adult and their caregivers or family. And so that purpose of that CGA isn't so much that you want to have all that assessment knowledge, is that you need that assessment knowledge to care plan in collaboration with your older adult. And what we particularly value, the, the comprehensive geriatric assessment, and why we chose it, is that it generates a frailty index. And the frailty index, why we, again, got excited about the frailty index, is it's such an accurate measure of the frailty risk. In fact, the research demonstrates that it predicts adverse outcomes, including mortality, disability, and cognitive decline, and it outperforms chronological age as a predictor. Um, 
it's the, if you're not familiar with the frailty index, it's the ratio of numbers of deficits pr o over the total number of deficits. And I know Dr. Muscadiri had brought it to your attention. It's very important to know that it does not exceed uh, 0.7, because that's about the degree of the, the number of health problems that can be tolerated by any living individual. And it does not always increase with age. It can also decrease because that re would reflect health improvement. So for us who are working in primary care, it's a good measurement for us because we're able to see if the care plans that we collaboratively draft with our patients and our family, um, if, they're, if we, we are actually having an effect. If we can measure their frailty index over time on a yearly basis, we can have an idea if, if what we're doing is really changing people's outcomes. And, and why we care about the frailty index so much is it's it not only is it that, that accurate uh, calculation of risk, but you can see that it is um, very closely correlated to mortality, and that's sort of the bad news. But the frailty index, based on a comprehensive geriatric assessment, identifies a group at the highest risk of dying. Again, correlates very closely. The value of that in care planning is that... Um, you know, looking at people is not enough to assess their frailty. And if we're working with families, we want to be able to have a very informed um, um, conversations to that piece. And so let me just go quickly to the care planning. So by reviewing that frailty index and the patient's placement on the clinical frailty scale, clinicians and patients are in a better position to draft effective care plans in collaboration, right? Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to wake up. <laughs> That's odd. <laughs> That's odd. <laughs> well, better late than never. Um, so most early to mid-frail older adults can be supported to address many of their health issues through exercise and nutrition and social engagement. And social engagement is really the piece that I want to talk to you about. So we developed this program, and we called it CARES, Community Action and, and Resources Empowering Seniors. So what we do is we use an electronic comprehensive geriatric assessment that generates a frailty index in the primary care setting at point of service. That's not possible anywhere else in, in Canada as we know at this time, because we really want to get it, the doc really needs to know what that frailty index is at that moment to better uh, craft that individualized care plan. And then the piece that we really wanted to address, which I think is hugely important, and the more I work with patients, I come to believe this even more, is that social component. Um, and so to that end, we were very lucky to get uh, funding from United Way to create new positions based on the UK social prescribing models. And, and the new people that we work with are called Seniors Community Connectors. And these people are located in um, community organizations uh, and, the, and where they can meet the senior either there or in their home or by phone or wherever. But this is, a, this is our model, right? So this is the CARES four-step model for frailty in primary care. So we're, we're actively case finding for at-risk seniors and currently we're using the clinical frailty scale four to six. In time, we believe through working maybe with PSP that we'll be able to get the computers to a flag um, at-risk seniors. We then do the CGA in collaboration with a multidisciplinary team in the physician's or NP's office. So if, if a GP does not work in a, in a team, they can, the CGA takes about 30 minutes, so then we recommend doing three 10-minute visits. We've made sure that it aligns with, an, in BC, the billing practices. So we support physicians to understand where it aligns in the billing practices so that they can best understand how to bill and comply and adopt because life I have learned in, in having been in about 70 or 80 uh, GP offices is very difficult for GPs and chaotic. So having to locate um, initiatives in the business models of healthcare actually makes sense for physicians and GP and NPs. 
So to that end, we, it works great if you're in a multidisciplinary team, and if you're not, you can do it independently over a series of three visits. And then you work, we, work, we of course, and every JP I've worked with believes in the working of, in collaboration with their, pa their patient and their family to draft that wellness plan that really sort of says, well, okay, now we know what your frailty index, we understand what your risk is, what, what are we gonna do about that? And well, there's some obvious things that we can do if they're medical. We can, I mean, the, what, what I love about the CGA is that in our, in our particular model, it flags the medications and lets the doc know if we're, you know, climbing too high in the medic, number of medications or, or the risk factors. Or, so it's, it's intended to help the physician, but on the, as I said, for those social indicators of risk, um, we have that seniors community connector we provide GPs with, but also we are really supporting um, our at-risk seniors um, to not only address their social isolation risk, uh, because we know how bad that is, and you know, I had the pleasure of sitting uh, at a table today with some social workers who were just, you know, they get it. They get how just devastating social isolation is uh, to the health and well-being of older adults, and and uh, and we have enough evidence to address that in itself. But we also know that in working with the senior community connectors, it's been my experience that if we really want to get our at-risk older adults out exercising and, and um, doing social connected behaviors like social engagement, or we want them um, to improve diet and nutrition, to eat better, that doing that with others makes a lot of sense. I'm, I mean, I don't know about you, but I hate going to exercise class alone. I love going with a friend. I love having dinner with people I like. And I even like having dinner with people I don't like as long as they entertain me, right? So, um, but I think that's true for probably just about anybody, and it adds to our quality of our life. So to that end, that's why we have really um, are starting to really appreciate and value the senior community connector um, in our particular project. And so when people ask me, well, what do they do? You know, the docs say to me, well, what does she do when I refer her there? And I say, well, the nicest thing that she does is she meets them and you can uh, fax her as much information as you want, you know, but she's really going to work on your patient's social engagement. She's going to get your patient sort of exercising specific to weights and cardio and, and, and support around healthy diet. And then if she really is, is worried about your at older patient, she's going to fax you back and say, well, actually, I'm pretty worried. Um, I don't think it's just that she's socially isolated. I think she's depressed because every time we meet, she's crying. And, um, you know, and there's indication that she doesn't want to engage. So there's some, so we hope to facilitate um, a um, conversation or some sort of communication between the GP office and the social um, connectors, right? And um, because that's helpful for the doc, it's helpful for the senior connector, but it's mostly helpful for our older adult who that, you know, as we look to really um, craft our care to be more patient-centered. So again, just to sum, that summary is, uh, the CGA is important to detect, to detect frailty early, and that we are great believers in the value of um, putting the frailty index in the hand of the, uh, the primary care providers and the patients and their families to draft informed care plans. And we're really um, very excited about the potential of seniors community connectors and, um, and, are, and are really grateful to have partners like the United Way to fund them. And lastly, I would say the piece that we are learning and what I really hope will be our next steps will be um, to look at more patient-oriented research. And we are particularly uh, grateful for funding that we received from the AFCC Collaborative because we're going to take CARES into Indigenous community in, in Chilliwack. I'm very pleased to announce that, especially when, since when we consider our earlier conversations around the health risk factors in indigenous communities. We're also taking um, this particular work to um, new immigrant families and South Asian families in Fraser Health. And lastly, we're working with divisions of family practice in Burnaby and geriatricians to see how we can collaborate. So we've got some new partners and also this 
this whole program locates in a CIHR research grant where we're testing the um, reliability and validity of the electronic CGA. So that's our little project, and it's our, you know, it's not the holy grail, but it's, it's a place to start, and the best opportunity has been, I mean, docs sometimes, you know, they look at me like this, you want me to what? You know, like, have you seen how busy I am? But I can always tell you that for uh, over the 200 patients or older adults that I've worked with, I would say about 99% of the seniors say to me, or older adults say to me, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do a comprehensive assessment for making me understand what my risk is. And, and if they don't say it, then their family says it. And, some of the th and then the GPs will often say thank you because they can see that in their busy lives it helps if someone is able to help sort of understand where their at-risk patient is. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate your attention, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. And I guess uh, I can wake up. <laughs> Thanks, Antonina. Thank you. thank you. So you can see why we would want to um, portray that wonderful piece of work. Um, not difficult to see how that one could be bought into large scale action and one that we might want to think about further. So next we have the opportunity to move to Linda Lee. Hi, Linda. Uh, Linda's efforts and uh, focus is on improving health care for older adults, particularly with, in this case, dementia uh, and other complex conditions associated with aging. Um, she cares for um, elderly uh, and older adults um, as a family physician, and, um, and that's how she focuses her time as a director of the Center for Family Medicine memory clinic in the Schlegel Center in primary care for elders. And she's the associate clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. Thanks for traveling this far to see us, Linda. She's developed a primary care memory clinic model and training associated with that model. The program uh, has assisted 114 primary care settings in Ontario uh, to develop new memory clinics. I've been hearing about them. In recognition for her leadership in helping to improve the care for older adults with dementia, she was awarded the 2014 Ontario Minister's Medal honoring excellence uh, in health quality and safety. Uh, so we're really looking forward to your presentation. Linda, thanks for being here. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to share with you about some of the projects we've been doing at our site in Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, I have just 20 minutes to share with you about two programs, so I'm going to speak really, really quickly here. Uh, the first is to talk about uh, um, C575, which is a program to, uh, to improve care for older adults living with frailty and then a mint memory clinic model uh, for those living with uh, memory difficulties. So first, a bit about C575. Uh, th this slide is just so you can see where the five C's come from. The Center for Family Medicine is a family health team that I'm part of, and this is about uh, screening for frailty uh, and then case finding for those complex chronic conditions that are often associated with frailty. It's a primary care initiative, and just in a nutshell, it started in 2012 with a desire to better identify those older adults living with frailty with the understanding, as Dr. Muscadaris had very nicely explained, persons who are at higher risk of adverse health status change. What we wanted, though, was something that was quick, measurable, practical, could be implemented in a systematic way in a busy, busy primary care setting. We have 18 full-time family practices. Uh, and the idea would be to be proactive about it, to identify uh, those persons who are frail, and then to case find for those complex chronic conditions that are typically hard to pick up early on in primary care, uh, but 
tend to present in crisis, tend to destabilize health. These are conditions that contribute to frailty, and frailty makes them worse. And to optimize their care, optimize medications, and address factors such as nutrition, such as exercise and social isolation, is very much a proactive approach, strengths-focused, try to keep people living in the community without health destabilization for as long as possible. Now, the, this slide, I guess, needs to be revised. Dr. Muscadari says there's 60 frailty scales. I had 27. Uh, there's many different ways to screen for frailty. Uh, I've listed the three most common ones that Dr. Muscadari had mentioned. Uh, we chose the freed frailty phenotype for a couple of reasons, mainly because it was the one that was most widely used in the research literature. Uh, we didn't want something that was dependent on our electronic medical records because, at least at our site, they're not always kept up to date. And we also uh, didn't want something that was dependent on judgment of functioning because you've got 10 minutes for a family doctor, usually the person's just already sitting in the room, uh, doesn't always know about the person's activities of daily living. So we wanted something quick and measurable. And probably the most important thing we did at our site was to validate that instead of having to look at all five freed frailty phenotype, we were able to show that just hand grip plus gait speed was an accurate, precise, sensitive and specific uh, proxy for frayed frailty phenotype. Uh, we did actually do all five, just so we could get the data to be able to show that you only need to do two. Now, gait speed is commonly used, but we found that it gave too many false positives, almost 50% false positives if you're using the standard of freed frailty phenotype. Uh, when you add in hand grip, that made it much, much more accurate. Uh, this was developed in 2012, multiple iterations of testing and evaluation, lots of input from all stakeholders, including patients, caregivers, uh, and just to ensure that it was efficient, uh, feasible, and acceptable to all persons. We were able to demonstrate in a less resourced site, a uh, group practice about 10 physicians in our community, uh, that with partnering with a pharmacy, community pharmacy, they could do hand grip and gait speed. And that worked out pretty well. And we're very, very grateful to the Canadian Frailty Network for supporting us uh, in uh, continuing to refine this and making it even better. Here's what this looks like. Uh, this is... Um, uh, it, we've divided into level one and level two. Level one is done at every, um, every, once a year for every person who's 75 years and older. Our electronic medical records flags the nurse who's bringing the patient in. This person is due for C575. So they get questions about falls, exercise, and they get hand grip and gait speed measures. We have duct tape marking out four meter lengths in our hallways. Uh, that's done every year. Uh, about 7% of those persons will screen as frail based on hand grip and gait speed measures. Those persons are offered a level two assessment, which is done at a separate appointment usually by a nurse and a pharmacist, and they get validated screening tools to look for malnutrition, cognitive impairment, uh, we use the mini-cog there, urinary incontinence, mood issues, um, like PHQ-9 for depression, GAD-7 for anxiety, Lubin social um, uh, isolation scale for social isolation. If they have a caregiver, we look for caregiver burden. We have various measures of fracture risk, all get a complete medication review, and we use something called the assessment urgency algorithm to look for highest risk individuals, and those persons we recommend uh, sending on to geriatric medicine for a more comprehensive assessment. The results of this are sent to the physician via very scripted, short, electronic m uh, medical records uh, messages uh, for the primary care physician to uh, to take care of. So what we've been able to show since 2012, over five years, more than a thousand persons have had assessments through this program, is that it's feasible. It takes less than seven minutes to do once a year, so very quick. And then uh, the 7% that go on to level two, it's less than 30 minutes for that. Uh, very highly acceptable for patients and their, their, their families uh, to the healthcare providers 
doesn't cost much. You just have to buy a JMAR dynamometer uh, for about three or four hundred dollars, some duct tape and a stopwatch, uh, and requires minimal staff training. And this is being spread uh, by uh, Canadian Frailty Network and Canadian Foundation for Health Improvement uh, across across Canada. Uh, and with our CFN grant, uh, we are refining this even further. So stay tuned. The other project that I'd like to share with you about is our Mint Memory Clinics. And this is also being spread, at least awareness is being spread across Canada through the Canadian Medical Association. We're very honored to have received the Jewel Healthcare Innovation Award. And this is, a, this is their writing. I didn't, didn't write this. Uh, the the shakeup that dementia care needed. Uh, Mint stands for multi-specialty interprofessional team, which is at the crux of this. The uh, Mint Memory Clinic model started at our site in 2006, and we've been able to spread it to 114 sites across Ontario. The cornerstone of this model is standardized, nationally accredited interprofessional training for family physicians, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, Occupational therapists, other healthcare professionals, whatever healthcare professionals a site has, we will build in. Uh, and all of them include Alzheimer's Society as well. Uh, and it's in collaboration with geriatric medicine, geriatric psychiatry, and cognitive neurology for those who need that expertise. So now, persons who have access to a mint memory clinic can have complete care, most of them, uh, without need for direct referral to a specialist. They can get full service care, one spot close to home from a skilled team that they trust who works in a shared care model with their family physician and the care continues on throughout the course. Now that's what this is. This is typical primary care practice uh, typically, most persons are not picked up. Uh, most persons who live with dementia uh, are not picked up until late. There is some world literature that says the underdiagnosis rate is about 60%. That is, about two thirds of people living with dementia in the community are not diagnosed for many, many reasons. And when they are detected in primary care, the typical response is to refer to specialists. A provincial evaluation suggests in Ontario the referral rate is 105%. That is, most persons identified as having memory problems get sent to more than one geriatric specialist. And there is the bottleneck, because wait times for geriatric uh, specialists in our province uh, can be up to six months to a year or more. Uh, there are only 300 or so geriatricians all across Canada. This is not a sustainable system. What we've built is this intervention in primary care called the Mint Memory Clinic to take the hardest parts out of dementia care for the primary care physician. It's a shared care model, but these clinics take the hardest issues, which is that early accurate diagnosis. It's easy to diagnose dementia late. It's not easy to do that early on, teasing out other factors, medications, comorbid conditions, um, uh, uh, many other, uh, other factors that need to be considered. Uh, driving issues, uh, system navigating in a proactive way, behavioral concerns that might arise, these are challenges. So we take those out, work in a shared care model, and probably the most important outcome that's come from our evaluative studies is first of all, high quality care. That is, primary care can do this, and we've published on that. I've had geriatricians audit my charts, and we had a CHR grant to evaluate five consecutive teams we trained. Two geriatricians audited their charts, demonstrating high quality care. The second major outcome is that instead of the 105% referral rate consistently across sites, the referral rate is now less than 10%. So this now becomes a system building initiative. It's capacity building, building capacity in primary care. There are, I think, what, 40,000 family physicians in Canada. So leveraging our strong primary care infrastructure 
and streamlining referrals to the specialist, only the cases that need to be sent to specialists. What we're working on now is building a triad of specialists to support each site, uh, geriatric medicine, geriatric psychiatry, and cognitive virology. They all have a role, and we're using e-consults. So probably less than 10% will actually need to travel to see a specialist. Uh, it's a... Um, uh, spread now, as I say, 114 sites. Um, more than 250 family doctors have been through this program. Uh, more than 55 specialists support our, our, our 114 sites, and more than 1,000 healthcare professionals, including, I think, about 120 Alzheimer's Society persons uh, who are embedded in these teams. Uh, we are not for profit, I should mention that as well. Uh, we just do this. Um, to cover our costs. We've been as far north as Red Lake, which is as far <coughs> north as you can drive in, in, in Ontario. Uh, we have many Francophone sites and many, many sites in the north serve First Nations communities. Uh, there is um, uh, one site that's in a, a homeless shelter. Uh, we have a Korean-speaking site, a, uh, a Cantonese-speaking site. It works just as well in these rural, remote, and underserved communities as it does in downtown Ottawa and London, where there's about five sites each. Uh, so this is uh, what we're about. But more importantly, what is the care experience like? Because that's what matters most. Uh, this is what care is like for persons living with dementia and their care partners. Uh, being a teacher and being a mother and a friend and all the other things that you have to be, you need brain for that. And some days I don't have one. And Dementia doesn't simply mean loss of memory, it means loss of cognitive ability. And in some ways, that's probably the more damaging. We've been very lucky in life. We're this this uh, August, we will have been married 53 years. Yeah. This is the only girlfriend I've ever had. Boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> the diagnosis then was a, really a continuum. It wasn't a set day. It was, I mean, this, is a, this disease is a progression. If you don't have a mint um, or memory clinic, as we call it, um, first of all, you're running blind. You're, you're dealing with ignorance, and it's already stressful enough. Backup. We have some backup. Oh, yeah. Well, an understanding. They give you hope. You know that this is not going to be magically cured. And they don't tell you that this will be either. They don't give you false hope. But you know you're dealing with someone who cares and will do the best that they can for you at the time. You're dealing with people who have specialties as a team. And there is a real sense of teamness. And there's a real sense that they care, like genuine. It's not, it's not put on, it's not fake. Yeah. <laughs> it's also economically a good thing. I mean, if you had to go into a care facility and you had, it doesn't matter how you cut it, that's going to cost all of us more money, right? I guess from a straight humanitarian standpoint, it's you're making people as happy as they can be in the last years of their lives. So across Ontario, uh, Kenora, Thunder Bay, Temeskiming Shores, rural remote communities, the experience is similar. Patients and family members uh, building a relationship with a highly skilled team in their primary care setting, uh, providing them with the care they can count on throughout. And coordinating, um, when you go to a Mint Memory Clinic, you get an accurate diagnosis, you get a comprehensive care plan, and you get care that continues on, that's coordinated. The team will help them to navigate a tough system uh, when specialist referral, if specialist referral is needed, they will manage that. If community resources are needed, agency support, they will manage that. Now, probably what's most exciting for us is the provincial evaluation that was just released uh, by our province in May. This was a, uh, a, a comprehensive, independent provincial evaluation funded by our Ministry of Health, 
overseen by Health Quality Ontario. I had nothing to do with this, except my site was one of many that was comprehensively evaluated. I should just mention that we used to be call ourselves primary care collaborative memory clinics, and we are now called Mint Memory Clinics. Uh, this is just cut and pasted from one of their uh, reports, and I've just highlighted it. Uh, what they found, in a nutshell, using extensive administrative level data from Institute for Clinical Evaluative Studies is that when people receive care in a mint memory clinic, that care is associated with a 38% reduction in overall health care system costs, costs per day. So if you look at some of the orange boxes here, uh, the cost of inpatient care is 50% less. The cost of emergency departments, about 50% less uh, because uh, hospitalizations and emergency department visits are shorter and fewer. Uh, Long-term care costs are less because they associate a almost six-month delay in institutionalization if a person has access to memory clinic services versus usual care. Overall, they felt it was a 38% lower cost per person per day because of the proactive care that these memory clinics are providing. We just extrapolated that to uh, a year, and so the overall um, reduction in health systems costs $26,000 per person per year. If you multiply that by the 113,000 persons in Ontario with dementia, if they all had access, potentially that's more than $3 billion in healthcare savings cost. Wait times for dementia care are cut by half. These are just quotes from that report. Uh, that high levels of patient and caregiver satisfaction, they did interviews with 180 people across the state, all stakeholders, including 23 patients and 27 uh, caregivers, positive impact on the quality of life, uh, and uh, this is a 5.4 month delay in institutionalization, and they confirmed our finding, which was 10% referral rates. The 105% referral rate comes from this report in usual care. And just uh, last word, uh, currently ex uh, a new initiative to look at frailty screening using hand grip and gait speed in our Mint memory clinics. Uh, this is uh, a work in progress, and you'll hear more about it. Uh, if you're uh, interested, uh, go to our website, uh, mintmemory.ca. Uh, just saying, we would love to be able to spread this to other provinces like BC. Uh, just uh, uh, we have a lot of people to thank. Uh, they're here, and if you want to contact me, there's my contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Randall. Wow, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. So you can see why we wanted to have these talks this afternoon. And now we have a third one. We're going to focus in on measurement. Um, and when you think about patient measurement, um, you have to think about Rick. And uh, Rick Sawatsky from the, the uh, Trinity Western um, University School of Nursing uh, is a Canada Research Chair in Patient-Centered Outcomes. And he's the lead of patient-centered outcomes at the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Studies, CHIOS, in Vancouver. Uh, Rick has been very active in the field of patient-oriented uh, research and measurement uh, and very connected to our support unit. And we are delighted that he actually is. His research focus looks on methods for patient-centered outcome measurement, the use of quality of life assessment tools, emphasis on people with chronic uh, diseases and their caregivers, so examples of current research include things like statistical methodologies for patient-centered outcome measurement, integration of electronic quality of life assessments into clinical practice, and things of that sort that would be of major practice relevance to us. Rick, thanks for being here. Please welcome Rick Swatsky. Thanks. Thank you. Great. So I'll... Um things a little bit short to, to keep on time. <laughs> You're okay. So, great. Um, so, thanks very much for this opportunity to, to share with you. I hope it will be informative to you. Um, where is my clicker? There we go. 
Um, so I'm going to briefly, very briefly, talk about a brief introduction to quality of life assessments. What do we mean by that? Then introduce a system that we use to administer quality of life assessments and integrate them in practice to enhance person-centered care for older adults living with frailty and their family caregivers. And then share some uh, research results from uh, uh, some studies that we've been doing. So I'm going to start off with very briefly a short video that was developed uh, by a CFN funded summer student actually uh, together with patients and family caregivers and our knowledge translation team to introduce the notion of quality of life assessments to patients and family caregivers. Maybe. There we go. Talking about your health can often feel overwhelming as it can be easy to forget or not even recognize key information to share with your health care providers. Sometimes the aspects of your life that you may believe are unrelated to your health are actually important to share with your health care provider. This kind of untapped information could limit your health care team's ability to tailor your care to best meet your needs. Your health care providers are not always able to tell what the daily challenges of your life are unless you choose to share them. And you might not recall every relevant detail on the spot. It is more than just about your symptoms and physical health, but also your emotional, mental, or social well-being, and your experiences with care. Fortunately, there is a way to address these concerns. Quality of life assessments offer a way to improve the care provided to you. They include questions that prompt you to share key information about your care and quality of life that may otherwise be forgotten. Your responses can help build your relationships with your healthcare providers in order to create a better treatment plan that is tailored to you. And because the questions ask you about how you feel and how you perceive your own health, there are no wrong answers. Your responses are there to monitor how you are doing in a way that goes beyond simply asking, how are you doing? The exchange of thoughts and concerns regarding your quality of life allows your healthcare provider to become someone who better understands and encourages your personal perspective on your own health. And including these quality of life assessments into your care plan may spark conversations that are essential in achieving a more trusting and therapeutic relationship between your healthcare team, your family, and yourself. So. Um, so this just get, introduces the idea um, to you. This is the notion of quality of life assessments. And quality of life assessments involve asking older adults who are living with frailty and their family caregivers about what matters to them, about their health and their healthcare experiences. Basically it involves asking questions that relate to how are you doing, how is your care, and what matters to you. And there's many tools available, hundreds of tools actually available out there that can be used to facilitate these quality of life assessment um, uh, processes. And they're often referred to as patient reported outcome measures, which consists of series of questions that ask about people's health, their physical, social, emotional well-being, and some even ask about uh, existential well-being. So these are questions about how are you doing? And then there's patient reported experience measures about the care that you're receiving. These consist of questions about are you treated with dignity, respect, or are you involved in decision making in the way that you want to be involved in decision making, goals of care planning, do you receive the information you need, and so on. Together these provide building blocks, a starting point for person-centered care that focuses on what matters to you. Here is an example of a PROM, a patient reported outcome measure for people with chronic life limiting illness or life threatening illness that we've been using quite widely. This is the McGill Quality of Life Expanded. Just as an example, these are domains that have been done, identified based on many, many studies with patients and family caregivers that are known to be of importance to the quality of life of patients living with life limiting illness. And similarly, there's also tools for family caregivers that draw attention to the needs of family caregivers, um, such as their environment, um, their focus on the patient's condition, but also their own outlook on, on life and their own care or quality of life and their social relationships. 
And then finally, there's also tools that focuses more explicitly on the care experience, such as the Canadian Can Help Evaluation Project tool, which includes tools for patients and family caregivers, focusing on relationships with providers, illness management, involvement in decision-making, communication, and feeling of peace. So how do we use these tools in our uh, healthcare system? Well, we use them both at the individual level and at the population level. At the individual level, frail older adults and family caregivers have opportunity to complete these tools, which are, by the way, completed very quickly. Uh, they don't take a lot of time. They can enter into person-centered health information systems, then be shared with the healthcare provider, uh, or the um, healthcare provider could ask for that information to be shared from the patient and family caregiver, uh, who can then be involved in person-centered care decisions, goals of care planning, shared decision-making, and so on. In addition, they can be used at the population level, where data from multiple patients and family caregivers are combined, analyzed to inform quality improvements, quality public accountability, and healthcare policies. At the clinical level, we know that these tools uh, can have um, a beneficial impact. This is not a new idea. There have been like four, almost five decades of research, of studies done on this. The first study in the 1970s. So not a new idea, a lot of evidence, many clinical trials and systematic reviews showing that the use of these tools can empower patients and family caregivers, could lead to more meaningful conversations, can help in improving participation in making the care decisions, and can promote person and family-centered care. And some studies even have pointed out that regular assessing a person's quality of life can save time in the long run by focusing on what matters to patients and family caregivers. However, these tools have not been widely used uh, to date in clinical practice. And this is what has motivated our research uh, um, that we've been doing since 2012. So in 2012, we started establishing what we call a quality of life assessment innovation community that includes patients and family caregiver panel, a clinician and healthcare decision making panel, a researcher panel, and a health technology panel to understand how to better integrate quality of life assessments in clinical practice. Um, and our first study was actually funded by CFN. Briefly, a quality of life and practice support system uh, involves uh, two components, one that focuses on quality of life and one that focuses on practice support. And too often, the practice support piece is, is, is missed. And so, of course, we want to draw attention to the quality of life assessments and to the needs of patients and family caregivers, but just assessment is not enough. We also need tools that will help to actually do something with this information to help and, and improve care, and that's the practice support component. In a nutshell, it works something like this. We have patients and family caregivers manage their own person health information system, so they are in the driver's seat. They can decide which assessments they want to complete. Healthcare providers can invite them to complete assessments, or they can do so, or patients and family caregivers can do so independently, and they can then choose which healthcare providers they want to share that information with through their own personal health record. The shared information then enters into the electronic medical record uh, where it becomes accessible to the healthcare provider and where it can then be used for person-centered care planning. And with person-centered care planning, we mean shared decision-making, focus on goals of care. In this case, in our case, we were focusing on patient pain and symptom management as well, and supportive services focused on enhancing quality of life with the ultimate goal of, of course, achieving these outcomes that we're all uh, striving towards for patients and family caregivers, as well as healthcare system outcomes. We're using uh, a, a system by a provider. I mean, we haven't you know, developed a system ourselves. Um, and so we're using the Cambian system. It is, uh, consists of two components. The Cambian navigator system is the one that's managed by patients where they can uh, complete information. They can also hook up to bio by their 
biosensors, data, their Fitbit and whatnot, and can be used to share other types of information. But our focus today is just on the quality of life assessment part. And the Cambion coordinator piece is where the, the healthcare providers can access that information, send out invitations to patients to complete additional assessments if they want, and also share educational materials. So briefly, patients log in, uh, older adults and their family caregivers log in. They have opportunity to complete an assessment. Here's an example of one such question. That information, and then they have opportunity to share that with their care providers. And it made, is made available in what we call a quality of life assessment profile. That gives for each of these domains that you saw in the previous uh, figure an overview of how are people doing in each of these different, different areas and what are the areas that we want to pay attention to. Of course, this information needs to be discussed with the patient and family caregiver. It shouldn't just be taken as face value, but it's an entry point to such a discussion. And the information can also be graphed over time to see how people are doing over time um, and seeing if the, if, if the healthcare services are having the desired impacts. And similarly, we have tools for family caregivers that draw attention to the concerns and needs of family caregivers. So over the past years, we've been doing a series of studies. The first three shown here uh, were CFN-funded catalyst projects. Actually, the first two were CFN-funded catalyst projects, focusing on the design and introduction of such a system, its integration into clinical practice. And the third one listed here was by a CFN fellow, uh, Marion Krasik, who was a, uh, is a med medical anthropologist and who examined the relational use uh, of this system of point of care. We're currently in the middle of finalizing our randomized controlled trial, and we're also in the middle of just finishing a knowledge translation initiative, which is also the CFN-funded projects. I don't have time to talk to you about each one of these studies, but I left the slides intact because I know they're going to be made available, and so I'm going to skip over some of this. But one study focused on uh, where uh, gave us opportunity to learn about how do you integrate into healthcare organizations, what are the technical considerations that we need to keep in mind, and what are the points of care considerations such as workflow integration and competence of clinicians in using these types of tools. So this is a bit of a teaser because I can't really, don't, we don't have time to go into each of these studies. But the second study, as I mentioned, focused on the relational aspects. So you could read that paper as well of integrating a QPSS. In this case, it was into a palliative care unit. And there we learned that, that there's different agendas at play with this information and that plays out in the, in the practice environment. This information is used at individual levels, as I illustrated, for person-centered care planning, but it's also used at MISO or organizational levels for quality improvement types of purposes, and also at societal level for decisions about equity, health policy, and so on. And each one of these levels brings in uh, different priorities, and those priorities actually work themselves into the practice environment. So if you want to learn about that some more, you could read that paper, which focuses on some of the tensions that clinicians needed to resolve amongst themselves in working with this type of information and these competing priorities by different stakeholders. And uh, then the final study had to do with the relational use of a QPSS in, in clinical practice. And, um, and here again, the only thing I want to say here is that often we see the use of technology as, as not a relational thing to do, but what we found here is that the technology actually became a boundary object and helped became a catalyst for establishing therapeutic relationships with patients. So not so much as, as a, uh, uh, um, um, a, a, well, so actually a facilitator of therapeutic relationships. So then finally, the final study I just wanted to share with you, if this piques your interest, um, we're just at the final stage of a knowledge translation project where we've been working with older adults and family caregivers, healthcare providers, healthcare leaders and managers, and government leaders and decision makers, all in panels to develop resources that would help them uh, use this type of information and these types of tools in their practice. 
and um, that's a CFN funded project. And that website, I wish it was live today, but it's coming live next week. So if you wanted more information, um, you could go to this uh, website, healthyql.com. If you Google it now, you won't find anything, but next week you will. And um, on that website, you find resources for each of these knowledge user groups, these four ones. This one demonstrates what we have for older adults and family caregivers. There's two videos. The first video is a live action video developed by a CFN funded um, Summer Students Award. And the next video is actually, you saw part of it at the beginning of the presentation. Then we also have pamphlets and so on to share with people. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> is that moved? Yes. So we have one more, uh, but I couldn't help but comment on the importance of measurement. Um, this is a very rapidly developing field, uh, just as the strategy of patient-oriented research is rapidly developing in this country. So too is the measurement agenda associated with it, and we really don't have much chance of uh, managing better if we don't measure better. And so uh, thank you very much, Rick, for that work and the work that your colleagues are doing in the country. Uh, let's uh, switch to Hitesh. Um, Hitesh uh, uh, ran out as a specialist in internal medicine and geriatrics. Uh, we've met before uh, in common ground. Uh, he practices at the Mount St. Joseph Hospital and at the Canby Older Mental Health Team in Vancouver. Uh, and he's an instructor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine in UBC. Um, Guidelines. Guidelines and the BC guideline for frailty is particularly a product of the work that uh, Tesh and his team have been working on. Um, he's been on several GPAC working groups, including development of frailty in older adults guideline, which we're about to hear about. Ritesh, thanks for being with us today. Please. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Hi, the ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Perry Kim and the organizers of this conference to invite me today. And it's been an absolutely fabulous conference. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, so today I will be reviewing the um, British Columbia Frailty Guideline for Older Adults. I would like to remind you that this guideline was published in 2017. And the work that went into this guideline development occurred of 2016, 2016 and 17. So a lot of this new research we are hearing about will need to be revised in the new guideline. But this is what we have right now for advice for family physicians in, in, in British Columbia. Top one. Green, green one. There. There we yeah. go. Good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So the objects of my presentations are twofold. I will review the purpose and development of the BC Frailty Guideline for all the adults, and secondly, to review how the guideline helps BC healthcare providers uh, deal with frailty care practices and their impact on their patients. Now, BC Guidelines are, um, produces clinical guidelines uh, to provide recommendations to BC practitioners for delivering high quality and appropriate care to patients with specific conditions and uh, diseases or conditions like frailty. So this is an example of that. Uh, the Guidelines and Protocols Advisory Committee is a joint committee of the Doctors of BC and the Ministry of Health. The Executive Committee and Steering Committees of GPAC uh, decides on guideline topic uh, development and working groups are set up. For full disclosure, I am on the, I'm a member of the Steering Committee of GPAC and I was also a member of the working group of this frailty guideline. The document is 16 pages long, and I will highlight just the major aspects of this guideline. The comprehensive geriatric assessment, as we've heard, is the accepted gold standard for the, frail, uh, for the care of the frail elderly. But this is classically done in, in a, a specialty geriatrician clinic with a strong interest clinic. Uh, interdisciplinary team. So, but given the enormity of the problem facing us, clearly this needs to go into primary care, and that's what we've been discussing, is how do we transfer this knowledge into the wider world?
The document starts by describing the purpose and scope of the guideline. The primary focus is the community-based primary care identification and management of old, older adults with frailty. There should be individualized assessment, and that's very important. And the tools provided to promote patient-centered uh, strategies to try and prevent further functional decline. Indeed, some patients with frailty may reverse their frailty status, as we've heard. You've also heard about the epidemiology of frailty, reminding you that there's about 128,000 individuals of frailty in British Columbia. And as we, time goes on, the aging population um, increases and we'll have more individuals of frailty. And hopefully we can reverse it and prevent it. Um, so the, the guideline also makes key recommendations which we described right at the beginning of the guideline, and there are seven key recommendations. The first one is early identification management of patients with frailty, provides an opportunity to assess and suggest appropriate preventive and rehabilitative actions, such as um, exercise program, um, reviewing diet, and medication review. Secondly, to use a, a diligent um, case-finding approach rather than universal screening. Many patients with frailty can be assessed and managed in primary care setting uh, through a network of support, and that's the key essence. You need a network of supports. As we say in geriatrics, math one equals zero because one person cannot do this job. Um, so you need a network of supports, including family caregivers and the community caregivers as well. One should coordinate the care with other care providers, so the physician is, should work with other members in, in the community and the family and patient. Um, fourthly, the patients uh, with frailty of multiple health conditions consider rolling assessments. This is, could be a long assessment. Don't try and do it in one assessment. Try and do it in multiple visits and target at least one area of concern in each visit. Fifthly, polypharmacy is a common problem with, in, in frailty pa patients and one needs to reassess the risk benefit of all these medications and also review over treatment of patients as well, which is quite common. Develop a care plan using the areas of geriatric assessment as we've heard about and we'll, I will discuss this in more detail in a minute. And lastly, initiate advanced care planning. That's an important component when addressing failed patients. So we heard about the definition of frailty. I'll just move on here. So as we know, there are several risk factors. The most common is advancing aging, but there are many reversible factors as we've heard about today, including nutrition, functional review, polypharmacy, social isolation, and medical and psychiatric comorbidities. We've seen the slide before showing how the impact of a minor stressor with somebody with severe frailty having significant uh, adverse events compared to somebody who's robust. The, the important issue too is hospitals are, have many patients staying for long durations because the recovery is prolonged. So this slide, uh, this slide provides an overview of the frailty assessment and I'll go through each of these components um, next. So the first section is, is about case finding. One red flag for frailty should be when older, health, older adults are integrating with healthcare services and social services. For example, when patients come to the emergency room, you should think about frailty, whether they have ambulance crew attendance, attendance to adult daycare programs, or need for home support. Secondly, the primary care physician should be aware of the possible early warning signs of frailty. These could be um, biological, such as, for example, if someone's had unintentional weight loss, or urine incontinence, or impairment of vision, hearing, or polypharmacy. Psychological factors such as delirium or cognitive impairment would also be red flags for the possibility of frailty. The presence of falls in function decline is another big red flag. Yeah. Patients with social isolation, those individuals transitioning in care, when there's a change in fair family or caregiver support, uh, one should be suspicious about the possibility of frailty syndrome in these individuals. However, many patients have biological, psychological, functional, and social factors in, in their development of frailty, and that's why you need a comprehensive approach. Another approach could also be 
the use of the PRISMA 7 questionnaire, which has been a validated tool with a high level of uh, screening for frailty as well. And that tool is given in the guideline. It's, it's from Montreal, I understand. So once frailty is suspected, it will need to be confirmed. And patients with most severe frailty are easy to identify, but milder, milder frailty will require some sort of an assessment to be done. Though there are research criteria for frailty, as we've heard earlier, these are not easily translated into clinical practice. And um, that's why we decided on the timed up and go test and the gate speed as confirmatory tools to, to be used for frailty diagnosis in primary care. Cognitive testing is also recommended. Now, once frailty is confirmed, its severity should be described according to the clinical frailty scale and which we heard today could also be used as a screening tool for frailty. Uh, the next step is to um, develop a care plan for the patient, which is done in several steps, right? So, because that's where the meat and bones are in terms of helping your patient. So firstly, you should inquire what's most important about, what's most important to your patient? What's their perspective of their issues? Next, review the goals of care, values and preferences, and the care plan should be developed jointly with the patient and the representatives. A detailed medical history, including current medical conditions and interventions should be reviewed. A medication review should be done and a process is described in the guideline about deep prescribing. Advanced care planning discussions are also encouraged. The care plan should be communicated to the patient, to representative and key uh, care providers as well. So it's a very important part is the communication of this information. We had a fair bit of discussion around that in our table earlier today. And we have a sample template in which to do this. Finally, this plan needs to be reassessed on an ongoing basis. It is not possible um, to conclude what interventions are the most effective and appropriate in a specific patient with frailty, and that's why you need a, to have a multifactorial approach to these patients and a multi-domain approach to these patients. Um, for example, one would perform a medication, uh, medical and medication review, and secondly, review psychological factors, thirdly, a functional review, and fourth, a social and environmental review. So in the medical domain, for example, you would also um, be interested in knowing the immunization status, the lifestyle of the patient, the nutritional status, um, bowel and bladder issues, vision, hearing, speech, and pain as issues as well. So with regard to the subdomains, for example, in the nutrition problem, you could make a referral to a dietitian through the HealthLink BC program or a hospital dietitian if you have access to one or privately as well. Um, you would also want to review vitamin D supplementation, and we actually do have a vitamin D guideline just published recently uh, as well. You also would want to know the protein intake because nutrition is, is associated with protein, protein deficiency, and, and that also needs to be assessed. In the psychological domain, cognition and mood should be reviewed. Um, cognition and mood should be reviewed, and we have appropriate guidelines to refer to that as well. In the functional review, there should be an assessment of mobility, falls risk, physical activity, basic activities of daily living, and instrumental activities of daily living. And we have documents there describing how to do a gate speed assessment and the time up and go test as well. Um, a referral to a physiotherapist, occupational therapist should be considered. Exercise recommended with resources such as community exercise programs, the Finding Balance BC website, and the Sale Home Activity program as well. We are currently, right now, working on a falls prevention guideline, which will be published soon. HealthLink BC also actually has um, exercise um, trainers who, who can talk to you and guide you into a specific program as well. The patient should also be assessed with regard to their hobbies, interests, loneliness, and supports. One should have, be vigilant about elder abuse, and caregiver stress as well. Referrals to long-term care and home care is recommended as appropriate, and information about the Family Caregivers BC website is provided, as well as BC Family Caregivers support telephone number is provided as well. 
So there are lots of resources in each of the domains and subdomains we, we talk about. We've talked about the clinical frailty scale, which in our garden we use to describe the severity of the frailty. Now this is really the important part in terms of communicating and documenting this information. Uh, the, the guideline does have a two-page PDF fillable uh, sample care plan template which can be shared with patients, families, and KK providers as well. For example, you could see here on, in this snapshot I've taken is covering uh, demographic data, comorbid conditions, your frailty scoring tools, patient goals and values, strategies, etc. Um, and, and the documents over two pages. So this is the second part where we talk about the medical, psychological, functional, and social uh, assessments. So advanced care planning is, is as we talked about, is important, and, and, and how to access resources in the community from home and community health and comprehensive geriatric assessment resources uh, um, locally, um, uh, where, where we have geriatricians available, of course, that's the limiting factor or family physicians with expertise. So in terms of critique of the guideline, one is the definition of frailty. There's no consensus about this. We use the PRISMA 7 time up and go test, and we're hearing today that um, time, um, gait speed and um, muscle strength testing would be adequate. Um, however, the approach we took was that of the British Geodetic Society in 2017, but they have since moved on to the frailty, electronic frailty index and we can discuss about that uh, in the discussion time. We don't have a, 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 a patient handout in this guideline, and um, one is, we, we normally, sometimes do we have patient guidelines, but we didn't have one for frailty, but clearly one needs to be developed so that we can provide a handout to patients as well. With regard to resources, these are difficult to write in the provincial document because things change regionally, and resources come, resources go. Um, so there needs to be a better way to do it. The Divisions of Family Practice on their website actually has a thing called Fetch for everything that's community health. So this is the, um, their website. Uh, so if you click onto your region, for example, Langley, you'll get all the resources in the Langley area. Now I don't, they have um, Pacific Northwest here and the Caribou in Northern Health. Uh, as well. In Vancouver Coast, it's only Sunshine Coast, so clearly this website needs a lot more information to be uh, put in as well. The other important website is bc211.ca, which is works on your uh, uh, po postal code to give you resources as well. A really important resource is HealthLink BC. They have healthcare navigators online, nurses, dietitians, um, exercise professionals, pharmacists, and importantly, they're also multicultural resource. They will talk to you in your first language. So this guideline, as I said, was produced in 2017. It was uh, sent for external review to over 600 individuals, and the feedback was largely positive. 94% agreed that the key recommendations were appropriate. 91% agreed the recommended frailty, schools, frailty scoring tools were useful. 98% agreed that the areas of direct assessment outlined in the guideline will help guide assessment. 84% would be likely or very likely to recommend the guideline to a colleague. However, there was no public uh, patient or consumer sort of input into the guideline, and, and that needs to be reviewed going forward as well. If anybody's interested, the guideline is freely available at the website bcguidelines.ca, and we also have an app in which you can download all guidelines. Thank you very much. Let me introduce one other person, and we're going to move to the panel quite quickly, and that's uh, Jim Mans. Jim, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Jim um, is going to be a substitute for David Hogan, who is now flying to his clinic somewhere in Calgary, I guess, by now. But I, I wanted to introduce Jim because he's gone out of his way to be here, and he's, going to be, he's had uh, involvement with the construct of the program. Um, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2007. And since then, he's been a very vocal advocate and a speaker in many efforts to reduce the stigma and the stereotypes associated with people uh, with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. He's been very active as a community volunteer and an advisor or a co-advisor with various research projects. And as far as I know, you had uh, your say in the federal dementia strategy. 
In line with Jim's focus on ethics and the ethics board approval process, he's joined our advisory council, the BC uh, uh, Research Ethics BC Advisory Council, um, and, um, and they have begun to meet and uh, benefit from his input. Um, Jim, please come to the stage and join uh, the other speakers that are going to join us here today. John from CFN, uh, Antonina Garm, here about CARES, Rick is going to come back on measurement, Ritesh is going to come back. So if you'd all come up, I'd also like to introduce, finally, the person that has been the brains behind a lot of all of this, and many of you know him quite well, uh, Ray Markham. Uh, Ray is the lead for the Rural Coordination Center of the BC, uh, and uh, we were working with the Rural Coordination Center of BC to form a rural and remote learning cooperative. Um, so <clears throat> Ray has been thrust into this uh, role um, about um, a half hour ago. Um, but just watch how he performs uh, automatically. And uh, we kind of thought it might be better if he did this than me. Thanks very much, uh, Ray, and uh, take it away. Thanks for that, Tom, I think. Um, so, you know, one of the things that really has intrigued me about the Academic Health Sciences Network, because I really have been trying to figure this out for a little bit of time, um, and I think it's been alluded to by both Charles and Tom today, is this idea of line of sight uh, between evidence um, and ultimately outcomes. You know, that so fundamentally what that means for us and what we really try to drive in putting this together is there's the evidence Kind of research and all of that kind of stuff and we have a great kind of cohort of experts around the evidence before us we've had a lot of it presented um, but we also actually need to have it applied kind of in structures process outputs outcomes ultimately in a way that's actually going to result for better health uh, for older adults in in rural and northern british Columbia. and you guys actually are the experts in that um, and with this, this expertise is meaningless if it sits on a journal uh, or a paper or a, a protocol or something like that if it doesn't get applied. Um, and the application of it actually sits in this room. And so um, we've really tried, there's been some really robust dialogue as to how we put this whole, these two days together in trying to hold that balance uh, in making sure that it's kind of not just a one-way conversation um, because um, really what is what the seeds of of how the supplies into the north is really going to have to be filtered through through the people who are in the north and who are in rural BC. Um, and so the way we've kind of constructed the panel today, and what I'm going to is, is going to be to try and create a bit of space for that. The table meetings earlier on were a little bit of a space for that. This is a bit of a space for that. And I think there are two pieces to that that we that you have an opportunity uh, to look at now. One is um, to pick people's brains. Uh, people who have expertise in various bits to see how they might apply. And there's also kind of a bi-directional learning piece around you have leaders, national, kind of international, provincial leaders uh, in uh, care, of, care of the elderly. Um, and um, you have an opportunity to, to influence um, as to how that applies in rural um, and how that applies in the north. And so I'm going to actually ask the, the speakers, we'll probably start from that end from Jim, and come down this way, um, just for a very brief reflection uh, from their perspective of kind of how things have gone this day, if there's anything that they've learned about how what they, their work applies in the north, any kind of aha moments or any gems that they would like to share, we'll kind of run through the panel and then it's gonna be open up uh, to the group to, tr to talk about it. And I have set my alarm uh, as well, so we've got half an hour. So uh, we'll start with Jim and come down. Today, in my mind, it reinforced the importance of knowledge translation and transfer. Um, there is not enough of that going on, and, and some of what we learned today uh, really shows the importance of, uh, of doing that in order to see impact across the country. But as we heard in this last presentation, there is no clear definition of frailty. 
council, I would just emphasize that words matter. And to that, there was an article uh, that was written about a qualitative study of the perceptions of older adults toward frailty. And they talked about identifying with frailty may become a symbol of resignation that due to the cultural, social, and personal perceptions of frailty, the acceptance uh, of the diagnostic label of frailty may foster a more negative perception of self leading to further decline. So I think that that um, is important, especially as it relates to people with dementia. Great, thanks Jim. Uh, John? Sure. So it's been a pleasure to be here and it's really uh, great to see the level uh, of, uh, of engagement. Um, I mean, from my from my perspective, um, the, the 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 issue about frailty is is that um, we need to uh, to address it head on. It's not something that we can um, that we can ignore, um, and and we need to to change the paradigm that it is it's a dynamic. Uh, fluctuating thing that there's can't be therapeutic nihilism for it that you can address it you can an, you can improve care and that's got to be the message overall and the improving care um, has to include case finding detection has to include more comprehensive assessment and has to include leveraging of multidisciplinary teams which I don't think we do uh, very well and certainly in remote communities that's probably a, a bigger challenges but there's ways that we can actually try to try to get around that and um, and it has to be addressed in all settings of care, starting with primary care where most of the people with frailty live, but then also starting to address and not special environments like acute care and long-term uh, and, and, and assisted living or long-term care where um, we have a, we can, there's a lot of room for, uh, for improvement. Great, thanks John. Rick? Do you want us to skip by you and come back to you? Sorry? Do you want us to skip by you and come back to you? No, I'm good, thanks. Um, so, uh, yes, I agree. This was a very helpful discussion. We had a fabulous discussion at our table. Um, some of the key learnings that, that are standing out for me is more learnings of opportunity. I see a lot of opportunity to focus uh, more on um, uh, placing patients and family caregivers uh, in the driver's seat of their care, not only at the center of care, of course, all we do is for patients and family caregivers, but placing them in the driver's seat of their care, uh, co-drivers together with the, the circle of care around them. And I think that relates a lot to what we've been talking about today. It's kind of a natural uh, next step. And uh, that involves knowledge translation, uh, the need for knowledge translation work, the need for patient and family caregiver engagement work, and the need to focus our outcomes evaluation of both our individualized person-centered care, but also of our healthcare system on outcomes uh, that include perspectives and experiences of patients and their family caregivers. Great, thank you. Linda? Yeah, I, I would uh, echo the same. It's just such an honor to be here, and I really thank Canadian Frailty Network and uh, uh, all of you for inviting me. Uh, the things that stand out today are the opportunities there are. Out of challenges, there are opportunities. This is a publicly funded system. We owe it to the public to create a much better system of care as we get older for all of us. So I think that's the one thing that stands out. And this is an opportunity to share some of the work we've done and for you to share the work you've done. Uh, the one take home is that the issues in Ontario are the same as the issues in other provinces. Uh, so that's one thing. The other is what an opportunity to meet so many people that are doing amazing work in your province, an opportunity to meet uh, the Jim Mann, who is so well known on social media, what a, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, I think everybody is doing great work. Uh, sharing and collaborating is the way forward. Uh, so um, oh, the one last thing is uh, Jim mentioned about 
the, the, the stigmatizing of labeling of, of, of frailty, and I think that's really important. I did want to say in our program, our C575, the word, word frailty is not mentioned. Uh, it is just a medical term so that we in the healthcare professional knows what we're taught, we know what condition we're referring to, and in the research world, we know what that is. But for our patients and caregivers, that word is not used. People are invited to participate. We say it as our family health team is, uh, our aim is to help older adults live the best quality of life as long as possible in their own homes. And this program is designed to see if you qualify for additional services and supports that could help you. And it's always voluntary. It was high level of acceptance. We don't use terms that uh, might have a negative impact. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everything that my colleagues have added to this uh, discussion. And I think the real opportunity at this time is for innovation and collaboration and to form relationships in the providing of care to older adults in new ways with really locating the older adult and family and caregivers at the very center of that, that effort. And um, to that point, I also think that our, our opportunity in assessing frailty really can be opened up for discussions at points of transition. Uh, you know, as we're seeing um, people are being admitted into emergency, um, as we're seeing people discharged from hospitals, as we're seeing people work in, uh, or I mean, or live and approach their primary care providers, through all those points of transition, it's good if all of us are using similar kinds of assessment forms, similar kinds of language, that, that there's a common understanding and that we're looking at ways to enhance our communication. So for the, for the older adult, they don't suffer that frustration of, I told my GP this, and now I'm going to see my... Um, geriatrician and I have to restate it all and um, so I'd really love to see the system be more supportive especially in how we communicate um, and how we support families and the last point is just really um, to really at this point you've seen many of us uh, talk about the uh, initiatives but the really raising uh, the voice and the inclusion of older adults in the work that we do is really, I think, the next big step that we have to do to provide culturally safe and appropriate care to the people that we work for and with. Okay, thanks, Renee. Hitesh? The nice part of it. Hello. Yeah. Oh, hi. Being the last person, I guess, everyone says the most gem, uh, the gems earlier. <laughs> I, I would just add that I think um, the, 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 the meeting has been absolutely fantastic. Really, some wonderful ideas have emerged, um, much to think about. Um, the, the concept of frailty is really the flip side of healthy aging, right? So whether you want to talk about frailty, it's really maybe talking about healthy aging. Even frail patients can have healthy aging ideas presented to them rather than using the terminology of frailty. So I think that may be a, a way to sort of um, get away from frailty discussions with patients rather than just talk about healthy aging, promoting healthy aging with vaccination, nutrition, exercise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so guidelines only um, are valid to the time they're written. I mean, um, so they really need to be updated and certainly this guideline will be updated in the next year or two with the wonderful new ideas uh, from the research being presented. I think a very novel idea that's come over the years is, is um, how do you help patients in the healthcare system, right? And that's what it's all about. And what changes do we, meet, what changes do we need to make? For me, I think the very valuable information is, is the value of coaches, because the healthcare system is complex. Like, as a geriatrician, I know the resources, but I don't know all the exercise programs in the community. What are the multicultural resources? I have no idea, right? But we will tell them to patients go and exercise, but where do they go? I don't know, right? So the importance of healthcare navigators are really is a, is a critical part in the healthcare system, but we don't have them right now. Annette is researching that, and clearly we're seeing some positive takeaways. International research has also shown the value of, of, of coaches, for example, in the Finnish um, geriatric aging study, where they had um, coaches uh, 
for about two years, the studies went along, and they were encouraging intellectual stimulation, exercise, um, nutrition, um, but, but there were people guiding the process through along, right? So we don't have the resource right now. From an interdisciplinary team as a geriatrician, I have lots of resources, but patients come and they discharge who follows up, right, as to what's actually being done. So I think the novel idea with the healthcare system needs to, to reflect on is, is who's going to pay for, for uh, coaches um, in helping patients navigate this complex medical, functional uh, health issues, hospitalizations, adult daycare, uh, visits, uh, nursing home transitions, um, caregiver stress. I mean, I think it, it's, it's a complex question and a, a complex funding issue as, as who's going to do it. But I think the research as it emerges will be very helpful for the Ministry of Health to, re to, to reflect on, on that kind of information and how to adjust the healthcare system accordingly. Great, thanks, Sadesh. So it's your chance. Uh, hands up, we've got uh, some uh, microphones. Uh, so any kind of questions, points of clarification, um, any thoughts as to kind of how this may or may not apply in our context? Or any examples of similar types of work or work that aligns with this uh, that is from the north uh, or from rural that you may want to share with the, with the group? Hi there, I'm Colleen McGavin. I'm the patient engagement lead with the BC Support Unit, which is part of the Academic Health Science Network. And uh, I have a question, or perhaps it's more of a comment directed at Hitesh. Uh, in going through the guidelines, a number of us at the table sort of observed that it felt like they may have been developed without the input of patients and the public, and you did mention that as part of your presentation. So just a humble suggestion that when you go to do the revision that you consider um, a really robust patient engagement plan for that. In fact, uh, that and we'll discussion help you with that. has happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It has Excellent. happened, and for example, there's going to be an ACEs guideline coming out soon, adverse childhood experiences, and there's a phenomenal uh, community involvement in that development of that guideline. So yes, GPAC has got the message. Yes, great. That. Good to hear. Thank you. By raise of hand. Could I just also just make a, a comment? Uh, all these guidelines, by the way, um, when the drafts are, uh, are finalized, they're actually up for external review on the website. So you can actually enroll into the, the BC guidelines website. So whenever there's a draft or something coming online, you will be informed by email and you can uh, provide feedback on the document. It's publicly available. Hi there, um, Shauna Dick from Vanderhoof, and I'm a care coordinator at a, in Sturt and Shackle Manor. So I see the sort of end result of like the residents are already with dementia and everything like that. So I'm, what I'm hearing from everyone is we have this bulk of patients in a sense that are funneling down into getting dropped into various facilities, whether they're appropriate or not, or, you know, that whole kind of thing, and that's what we're struggling with. So what I'm wondering is it sounds like um, we need to take steps way further back. So um, lots of family education or just general public education about early signs of people starting to slide, right? So I don't think families realize, I mean, they just say things like they're getting older, um, you know, this is bound to happen, or even me, I'm waiting for my parents to just break a hip or have a stroke or something like that, right? Like right now they're healthy, but we haven't got anything, anything in place, you know? And where do we go right now? So what's, even me being in healthcare, what is my step? Like, so, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. So, because we, we are too reactive, so we wait until something happens, and then, and then we're like, whoa, okay, now I have nothing in place, I have to go to work, I don't know what to do with my mom, you know, like that whole thing. So I think that's kind of what I'm wondering. Anyone want to take that on? <laughs> Yeah. 
I just want to say is, as it relates especially to dementia, I think the, well, and even aging, I, I think so many of us don't, are not proactive because, you know, you want to put the hand up and, oh, like, I'm not going there. And I, and I say that highlighting an Alzheimer's Society of Canada poll that was released a couple of years ago, and I, I mean, when you've, when it, 46% of respondents would feel ashamed or embarrassed if they had dementia. And 39% of Canadians would offer support for family or friends who were open about their diagnosis. So saying the other way, two thirds of respondents, dementia is felt to bring shame to the family. So until we get over the stigma of dementia, until we get over the stigma of frailty until we, I guess, admit that we are getting older, there are some big hurdles to, uh, to get over first. And if I can just comment to what you were saying too from what I heard, um, I was really touched by what you said because, you know, I was thinking that even as a clinician, um, I could not prevent my mom from in the end becoming frail and, and passing. But um, my hope in, in the particular work that I do is that we can support primary care providers and primary care networks with the best education that they can have working in collaboration together and with education and with the tools so that they can provide the best kind of frailty assessment. And hence that, that leaves the rest of us trusting and knowing that our primary care teams are well informed, they're using excellent tools, they uh, work in a multidisciplinary team, and also they leverage community-based resources. So that seniors community coordinator knows where to go get some of those socials. So you can actually relax, you know, because I I was used to be terrified as a, as a healthcare provider with an aging mom who was fr becoming frail that I didn't know enough. And then if I looked in the anxious eyes of the GP, she didn't know enough either. And together we just, you know, we just would be shaking in anxiety. But that's really what drives this work, right, is this vision that we can, as a community who are care providers and family members or older adults ourselves, know that we have a point of entry. It's the primary care entrance or the primary care network as an entrance point. But also, if we are to go into emergency departments, they too know. Or when we're being discharged from uh, medicine, they know. Hence why um, the opportunity is here in, in getting together as a group. And I heard someone say today, someone, I think, um, for, we want northern solutions for northern people. And so the, the answers are here. We can only bring our experience, some of the work that we are trying as we try to roll the ball up the hill to provide better services. But really, the, I, I suspect the solutions are here. And the people who are going to make that happen are already in the room. Thanks, Nick. John, I think you're... Yeah, no, I, it, so that, that's a, a really a great question, and, and I would, uh, and I agree with the things that have been said. Um, the the solutions are here, so so I think we need to start to think more about the preventive lens and what can we do to actually encourage the healthy aging or the blunt that uh, that curve a bit, and then doing all the things. Um, like uh, promoting activity, vaccination, reduction of social isolation, making sure that you're on the right set of medications, that you're on the appropriate uh, diet. So try to blunt um, that curve uh, going forward. But then also, I think we don't do a, as good of a job as we should in, in all environments, and obviously I'm not familiar with this environment, but it is in supporting people at home and reabling them to stay at home or to stay in their preferred in environments. And I'm not talking about rehab, I'm talking about reablement. So you actually increase function at home, you actually teach people to live safely in their home environments because that's when 
the, because people cope at home, marginally cope, and then the disaster happens and they wind up in acute care and we're not really well equipped to handle people with frailty or cognitive issues in, in acute care. So you want to prevent that. You want to support people at home as much as possible. And to that end, you want to leverage whatever community resources you can um, to, to do that. Also, there, there's a lot of times in many communities, there's lack of awareness of all the supports that are potentially there. And we don't do as good a job of keeping those up to date so that you actually know either as a, as a caregiver or as a healthcare provider about what supports that there are available. And that gets down to the social prescribing um, uh, level. The other thing that I heard in the conversation is, is that uh, maybe we should also start to think about uh, uh, educating caregivers. Um, you know, people um, before, before they actually become caregivers, be, do it proactively, which would be innovative, which I don't think is done, is done anywhere, but th that would be a way to relieve some of the anxiety, the stress of, of, of looking after um, somebody who is in functional decline. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, Dave? Uh, thanks, Ray. Um, I'm Dave Snadden. I'm the, the Rural Doctors UBC Chair in Rural Health. My role in life is to continually poke my urban colleagues to remind them that the rest of Canada exists. <laughs> and you, it's great. You've, you've kind of begun to answer what I was thinking about, but I'd like to just take it a little bit further. We all know that um, rural and indigenous populations suffer serious inequities and disparity of access. And we're no different here. If you live in northern British Columbia, you die five years earlier than you do if you live down the lower mainland. A lot of what I'm hearing is these wonderful things we're doing. A lot are developed in centers where there's more resources. And I, I guess my, my worry is, is, as we see more, no, more knowledge and more ways of dealing with it, the equity actually, if we're not careful, gets worse because in some areas that they keep developing, in rural and northern areas, we may still be left behind or get left further behind. So my question to you is how in this environment and in this growing area, Prince George has got the highest growth rate of seniors in the province right now, I understand, is that how are we going to bring true equity into the system? Because it's not there yet. We don't have the HR resources and things like that. It's an easy one. I can, uh, I can address that to some extent. Of the 114 Mint Memory Clinics in Ontario, most are in rural, remote, underserved areas. In fact, Health Quality Ontario funded us uh, two years ago to, uh, they gave us the funding to train 17 sites, but it had to be rural, remote, and underserved. Uh, some of the sites are as small as 2,000 persons up in Manitou, Watch, which used to be a mining town, and Two-thirds of the town has shut down, but there's a huge number of older adults there. Uh, as I say, the, the, these are some of the, like, Wawa and Ignace, tiny rural communities where you can build this. So I think that there's some elements. Uh, one of the things that I think has made our model um, adaptable and, and the implementation fidelity to, to the model is high based on the, health, uh, the uh, provincial evaluation. Uh, about 90, more than 95% continue to operate uh, since training, and we started in 2008. One of the um, key ingredients is adapting to the community, and that's part of the training is mentorship, two days of on-site mentorship. It's discipline to discipline to make sure the model fits the needs of the community. Uh, so I think it can be done. Uh, it needs some adaptation, uh, but it can work. And if I could just add to that too, um, I have 15 years of working in indigenous um, communities from all the way from Aklavik, Anuvik, all the way down to the New Chelneth. And, and then I was uh, one of the founders of the Shiway Project in Vancouver's downtown east side. So I had the great privilege of working over 11 to years in, in indigenous communities. And um, 
also in the particular area that we work in, Fraser Health, it, there is large parts of it are, are rural. So I don't want to leave you with the, this sort of um, misapprehension that this is all happening in some flash center. And I should really talk to you about my extensive resources that I have. You're actually looking at her. Um, it isn't, there's nobody else, but but what I have found is in um, we, our hope is in technology, as in our partnerships and leveraging our partnerships with c community. Um, so the particular model that um, we drafted for CARES really comes from some of the work that I uh, did in working with um, Aboriginal communities and um, working uh, the Shiway model, where we were really looking at putting the um, at-risk individual at the center and then making sure that they, we had these wraparound services. So really, for, for our particular model, its roots are in my experiences in, in rural communities and in working with indigenous peoples and in what, what helps in, in those types of communities. So that's what I would have to reflect back to say, please, I hope we're not leaving you with some idea that this is something really flashy, full of lots of resources. The opportunities are in technology, in the research, but mostly in the people who will, you will form the relationships with and that will become the community um, connectors or the, the people to address the social isolation. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'd just like to thank you so much because this work is so needed and everyone today was so on target with what we need. Um, I was, in a way, uh, the previous question uh, touches a little bit on what I'm talking about. I'm Delia Cooper from the BC Academic Health Science Network. I'm on the board there and a patient representative. Um, my concern is yes, the North does need all these services, but in the community I live, 78% of the people who live there will be seniors by 2020, which is next year. And I don't think that the services are anywhere near ready to handle what we are going to experience in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and I'm hoping that every health authority and every uh, group that is dealing with frailty will be addressing the demographics of various communities. No, I don't live in Victoria. <laughs> it's actually the Tri-Cities in Coquitlam and Port Moody and uh, Port Coquitlam. And um, that the reason for this is that all of our young people have moved out of out of the area to live in Langley and so forth, where it was more, more um, affordable to be able to, to uh, buy a home. And so that's why we are left with this community and it's going to really be a shock in the next few years. So I hope that you'll, you'll have something for us to do, to uh, look after us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Annie Richtera. Um, I'm a patient partner with the BC support unit, and but I also have a lot of experience working in the healthcare field in different capacities. From, uh, I wanted to address you where you said with the health coach, that it is important to help uh, health coaches, health coordinators. And uh, besides, I tried 17 years ago almost, uh, I tried to put a business model together and write a business plan of becoming a health coach and care manage, manager and, and to do it as a private business. Um, the responses were fantastic, a lot of support and stuff, but nobody wants to pay for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the problem is, is like creating these positions but also financing it and they also have a model behind it. But there is a, uh, um, an organization, University of Victoria, with the uh, self-management program. So it's the Center for Aging. And with the self-management program, um, they work with volunteers and they also have a health coach program. So just for your information that this can be used and utilized and it, it's all volunteer work. Thank you. Great, I think we're, well, we've got a couple of minutes. One hand up the back, so maybe last uh, question, comment, and then it's coffee break. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Lori DeCruz. I'm the First Link um, educator and support person for Northern BC for the Alzheimer's Society. Um, I just wanted to say, and just a more of a reminder about using the services that already exist as well, while we try to figure all this out, is that we are here to help support individuals affected with any type of dementia, their care partners, their family, our communities with dementia-friendly communities, um, and healthcare professionals. We do education and do lots of support for healthcare professionals. Um, so just know that we are here to help support during this transition and trying to work it all out. Our first link to dementia support, we call our clients minimal every three months just to make sure they're okay. Uh, all through Northern BC, currently we have well over 2,000 um, active clients within Northern BC that we connect with regularly. So just a reminder during this hall as healthcare professionals, as community organizations, that we are here to support you as um, community organizations, as healthcare professionals, to hopefully take some of the weight off through our education and support. Um, just connect with us. Great, thanks very much. And what a kind of excellent kind of point to end on is around the resources that are around. And if I've heard one thing today is really the importance of us getting better. Maybe one of the first steps is us getting better at actually connecting with and figuring out the resources that are actually working and that are already available and being able to connect to our providers and the patients with those things. So I think it's coffee break now for 15 minutes. Um, and then Rita has her um, panel thing, so. 3.15, please.
There's hope. There's hope. Okay, let's resume if we can, please. Okay, folks, here we go. Please let me start by introducing our panel. Hi, everyone. Hello. You all ready to go? Good. Are you absolutely sure what you're going to do yet? No, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll make it up. Let me introduce one of the panel members who will help me with the rest. Uh, Rita is known to all of you, I'm sure, in the north. Uh, Rita's moniker is Aging with Attitude. This is a lady, a Aging with Attitude. And as I mentioned before, for those of you that are boomers that want to have a zip, you can now be Zoomers, um, according uh, to Rita. Rita's assembled a small panel, and what we're going to do uh, tomorrow uh, in our breakout is we're going to have this session uh, go much deeper with you discussing uh, avoid. You've heard about avoid already. Uh, what we're going to do today is a bit of a simulation exercise, as if it was kind of a radio talk show sort of thing. Rita, as you well know, is very well experienced in doing that. Uh, and she's engaged now with uh, the group that is going to actually take us through the A, V, O, I, D considerations. And, why they may be somewhat important for us and how we might think about those from a very preventive point of view, um, primary or secondary from that point of view. The good thing about managing people with frailty is all those things that you do for people that are already frail are also good for those that are otherwise not frail and just older Canadians without frailty. So what's good for any older adult is good for frailty. What's good for frailty is good for any older adult. Rita. Take it away, please. Thank you, Tom. So um, some of you might know me from my radio and TV talk shows that I have here in Prince George. It's called Aging with Attitude. Uh, just to describe a little bit about what aging, what aging with Attitude is. Um, it's largely dedicated to the population base between 45 and 64. And 45 because um, that was the first organization that I started working with, they were sort of targeting the age of 45 to start because they thought that that's a good age for people to start thinking about what does life's second half look like. So 264, and meaning that you know the government already has 65 plus covered, so um, we'll do it to 64. So um, and and of course anybody who's older or younger than that who sort of um, supports a holistic way of aging well, and that means all dimensions, physically, mentally, spiritually, um, all, all different kinds of ways, and it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that we stop work. Um, personally, I want to take a couple minutes just with that patient hat on of mine, talk about labels. Um, for me, and this is just for me, um, when I hear the word senior, I think of that frail person that we've been talking about all morning. And I don't want to be that person. So needless to say, I was so excited to find out we could avoid it. Hence, we're talking about avoid. <laughs> and um, uh, retirement, I mean, I think, well, I'll never retire. I might regroup. But, you know, that's going to be, I can do things that I always wanted to do. And, um, but it's regrouping. I also wanted to say a little bit about an experience Last night, um, I went to um, a little conference at UNBC, and it was on aging and all the devices and stuff that could be used. And I was, um, I, I went with a couple fellow people that are in this room here today, and I won't say who, but um, partway through that, I mean, they were ta they, all these people. They were that they were of the older variety. They were, you know, they were having, they were falling down. They were getting little devices that you know, would tell them to go back to bed, and they had Alexa's voice um, telling them to go back to bed when they were wandering in the night. And um, the one guy got so scared that some woman was out there telling him to go back to bed that he never come out of his room again. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, this particular session is more of the citizen's approach. Um, so, just going to talk a little bit about that, a citizen's approach. But, and this, this um, setup that we've got here is very much like it's a round table, like what we do at Community TV. And some of these people I've even inter interviewed before. So it's kind of fun, and I'm looking forward to hearing their perspective. Um, I just want to quickly introduce, before we get started on the whole avoid, we've got John Muscaderi, John. Um, we've got Todd Alec. We've got John Brink. We've got Maureen Shields, myself, and we've got Joyce Resin. So to get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about, we're going to get John to kick us off here, John Muscaderi. And John, you're the scientific director of the Canadian Frailty Network. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that is and, you know, and your role as a scientific director? Like, is it full of science or what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so thank you, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm the scientific uh, director, which means, uh, which means overseeing uh, the network along with uh, the rest of, uh, um, of, of the team uh, that's uh, uh, headquartered in Kingston. And, and so we oversee a large research program, we see a knowledge mobilization program, and uh, also networks and partnerships along with the training program. And one of our goals is to actually start to promote um, uh, healthy aging and, uh, and uh, try to prevent or mitigate the progression of frailty. And just to, um, that frailty, it's a dynamic state. It can either be mitigated or prevented uh, from progressing, and that's, uh, and that's what our goal is going to be in the next couple of years, to roll that, out, that, can to roll that campaign out. Well, that's, that's really exciting, John. And, you know, everyone in this room um, probably are here because they've got some degree of change-maker attitude in them, and a little bit of that attitude, I like it. And um, so... You know, I mean, we're those pioneers. I mean, we're helping to create a program to roll out a different way of doing things. So, John, we've heard a lot about AVOID, and could you tell us what the acronym AVOID means? I mean, I know it was mentioned earlier in the day here, but what can you add to it? So, sure, it's really fortunate when anything that you're promoting fits into a really nice acronym, and AVOID is a great acronym. Um, and uh, so the components of AVOID are the A stands for activity because we know um, that uh, maintenance of activity levels are an important part of, uh, uh, of maintenance of function in, in aging and also an important to maintain cognitive function going forward. The V in AVOID stands for vaccination. We know that, uh, that there are diseases that can be prevented and uh, um, and certainly as you get older, your immune system starts to decline. So, um, so it, it, important to maintain your yearly vaccinations, your vaccinations that you have uh, periodically, uh, and those that the, um, you get once, uh, once in a lifetime. Um, the O is optimization of medications to make sure that you're on the right set of medications uh, for the stage of life that you're on. Uh, Canadians consume a lot of medications. Um, and uh, it's important to try to, to be sure that the, the ones that you're on are absolutely uh, needed and that you are on the appropriate ones. Uh, the I stands for reduction of social isolation. We know that social isolation and loneliness are, are deleterious to your health. They're equivalent to, um, to, smoke, to a smoking habit, so reduction and improvement of that is very important. And finally, the D stands for diet and maintenance of adequate, uh, uh, adequate nutrition, since we know that, those, that there's good evidence that uh, uh, maintaining your inadequate diet, maintaining a good nutrition, um, along with uh, supplementation is needed, may prevent uh, long-term declines or may help uh, maintain your function at where you're at. Thanks, John. And also in your, um, in your line of work, you are a general practitioner, is that right? You are an actual doctor and you, you meet with people and talk to them about illness. Can you expand a little bit on that work? Yeah, it's hard to believe I am a doctor. <laughs> um, 
So I, I'm actually a critical care physician, and, and actually I see people at the end when when uh, they've either had progressive frailty or they've had the disastrous declines in, in their health. And one of the things that uh, really um, this helps address is the vaccination component, since we see, especially as the flu season comes along, we see people that develop severe cases of influenza uh, um, that can require hospitalization or even life support. And a lot of those people never get back to their pre-morbid or to their pre-illness level of function. So, um, so these type of uh, things are really important to try to prevent to seeing somebody like me. Thanks, John. So we'll move on with what the AVOID um, acronym actually is. And with that, we are gonna, we've got um, Joyce Resin. Now Joyce is um, to my uh, left here. And um, she's actually um, the BC represent representative from the Canadian Frailty Network. She's also a fitness instructor. So being that she's got the letter A to deal with, um, she's got some activity planned here for us. So Joyce, take it away, and um, we're ready for a little bit of music. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready? Oh, oh, just a minute, Joyce. I just have to ask you. Now, <laughs> um, you are, talk a little bit about your credentials. Now, you know a little bit about the activity, and activity for older people. Now, is that different from regular activity than younger people, or tell me about it? Okay, well, uh, yes, I have some credentials. I sometimes refer to myself as the oldest still living, still teaching fitness instructor in Canada, and that's because I was certified in the very first cohort of people to be actually certified to do uh, fitness teaching. It used to be that, you, that anybody could hang out a shingle and call themselves a fitness instructor, but not, not so much anymore. Um, I never intended to actually teach fitness classes, but that first cohort, uh, the course was being held at the YMCA in downtown Vancouver, and I thought it would be a great way to meet men. Anyway, that, and the rest is history. I've, I've been teaching ever since, and I certainly have seen many, many changes, uh, you know, in terms of fitness. Now, you know, what, what we all need for fitness is pretty much, it's pretty much the same. I think it's a question of, of focus in terms of, you know, what we need as we get older. So uh, we all need cardiovascular fitness. We all need to have, you know, our heart and, and our lung capacity has to be, has to be worked. Uh, flexibility. I don't know how, I mean, maybe I'm not the only one here, but when I get up in the morning, I am much stiffer than I ever was as a younger person. Is, is anybody else? You're all 45. Do you? Don't you? Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and that's because, you know, the joints take a lot of wear and tear over the years, uh, or we may have incipient arthritis. Um, and so we need to be working, uh, we need to be, uh, be, be conscious of including flexibility exercises. We can talk specifically about what that looks like as we, as we go. And then uh, evidence-based research is showing that resistance training, strength training, somebody talked about that earlier today, is absolutely critical because as we get older, we lose muscle mass, we lose, as women in particular, we lose bone mass. And when we talk about uh, resistance training, it's training that using those therabands, the elastics, using, uh, using weights uh, to build up the strength so that we can, you know, we can carry our, our uh, groceries and we can do, do the kinds of things that are important. The other thing that I think has really changed in fitness is, is the notion of functional fitness. And what that means is teaching the body, training the body to do the things that we need to do to continue to be independent, to continue to be able to live in our own homes, uh, if that's what we choose in our own communities. Um, and I can give you an example of that. Do you want an example of that? Does this mean we're going to start our activity? No, well, sort of, but not quite yet. OK, hopefully we have some time. Fun to every, anybody, everybody's heard of functional fitness. Earlier, we talked about, I, 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 want you to, I want you to work with me on this one, and I think you'll, you'll see what I mean. Earlier, uh, we talked about one of the um, uh, criteria for, for determination of frailty or level of frailty is being able to get up out of a chair. 
being able to get up out of a couch. And that certainly is something that deteriorates as we get older. So with an older cohort of people or you know, with, uh, with older adults, one of the ways that we train well, I want, I want you to try it if you'd like, OK? Move to the end of your chair. OK, move your chairs out. I'm going to ask you to stand up afterwards, but move, move. OK. I want you to make sure that your heels are, are, are down, that you're using, you can feel your heels on the floor, that your, your knees are parallel to each other, OK? Place your hands. Oh, by the way, if anybody has knee issues and you're feeling any twinges, please, please, please my, be mindful of that. You don't have to, you know, just watch. Bring your hands to your chair and, and pull yourself up, okay? Or push yourself up. Take it down. Push yourself up again. Take it down. Push yourself up. Last time. Okay. Whoops, I'm losing my, my microphone. And come on down. All right, so that's step one. What we're trying to do is to train the core, the quads, and the glutes. You know where the glutes are? To, uh, to lift the body, because those are the muscles that you need in order to be able to lift the body. So that's number, step, step number one. Step number two, use your arms. So you lift with your arms, and now sit back on your chair. Make sure your chair is behind you, by the way, guys, OK? We don't have insurance for problems. And release. And one more time, release. Yeah. Come on down. Nice. So there you're using your arms, not just your hands to push. You're using your arms to help reach. Step number three, when, when we get to that, that point, place your hands on your shoulders. You will not have the use of your arms or your hands. You will have to use the core and, uh, and the quad muscles and the, and the glute muscles. Okay. Take an inhale, a good inhalation through the nose. Come on up and release back down, and come on up, and release back down, and last one, come on up, and release back down, and give yourselves a good hand. Oh my god, you guys are... <laughs> so that's just an example of functional fitness, and there are lots more examples that, you know, fitness instructors are, there's actually, there are some kinesiologists here, and they may have some other examples to, to show. But that's, that's specific movements to train those muscles that will help us to be independent. Okay. Thanks, now, Joyce. Does go? that mean we're going to have some tunes now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Darren, take it okay. away. So I'd love you to work with me. Um, but please feel free not to if you don't want to. If you're going to sit in your chair, though, I really want you to be moving your arms, okay? But if you'd like to work, we're going to do four and a half minutes of a low-impact uh, workout. Uh, low impact because as we get older, we want to, you know, we don't want to do more damage to those to those joints. And what about us, Joyce? Um, Can we do this? Yeah, I would really, I'd love you to do this. I don't want to be the what only one up here. There? Can we stand that one? Yes. Uh, by the way, step away, guys. Please come. You, we, you, need, you need space. So please feel free to use the empty spaces. There's lots of empty room over here. Uh, uh, and move, move up, move up, move up. Come on up, somebody. Use that, use that space. Because what I'm going to ask you to do to begin with is open, spread your arms and just soften your knees and turn and turn and make sure you don't whack anybody. Okay, so that's the purpose. So now if you, if you are whacking somebody, please come over here, <laughs> yeah. If you're wearing high heels, I don't know that anybody is, take them off. Um, and I want you to take three steps forward and three steps back because we are going to move and I don't want you banging into anybody in front or in back. Are we okay? No stepping on anybody's toes. Uh, before we get going, there are two rules. Really important rule if you have any issues, right? You have a shoulder issue, a back issue, a knee issue. Um, please listen to your body. It's absolutely critical. I don't know where any of you are at. So if, if I do anything that makes it, you know, that, 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 that hurts, it's wrong for you, okay? That's the first thing. And then the next rule that I always have in all of my classes, please smile. Even if it's killing you, okay? It's horrible to look at it, at people grimacing. Okay, so um, everybody have room? Everybody have space? Work at your own pace, all right? Work, work whatever works. And, and don't, please don't blame me for the music because Rita, Rita chose it. <laughs> all right, so we've been sitting all day. We're going to start Maestro, the music. We're going to start... We're going to start just shaking your body. Just shake everything out, all right? So shaking your shoulders, shaking your hands. 
down. Shake your head. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. Nice. Okay, now we're going to be marching. So just a gentle march. And now that nice deep inhalation you did this morning when we, when we had a nice welcome. Inhale through the nose. Exhale through the mouth. One more time. Hold it here. Place your hands on your, your waist. Four, three, two, and side to side. Step. Step. Nice. Four, three, two, one. Add your arms. Nice round arms. One. Oh, yeah, you're looking good. Five steps. Four, three, two, one. Stretch it up. Reach to the ceiling. Nice. Four, three, two. Take it across your chest. Reach, 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 reach. Cross your chest. Follow your hand with your eyes. Four, three, two, one. Now push down to the floor. Four, three, two. Change now. Give me your heels. Your heels. Up and down movement. Four, three, nice. Two, one. Hold it here. Change it now and tap. Tap, tap, tap. Four. Three, two, and one. All right, pump it now. Okay, now we're gonna start to move. The rhythm is this. One, two, three, pop it. One, two, three, pop it. Pop it. One, two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Going forward now. One, two, three, back. We'll roll. One, two, three, yeah. Nice. Three, two, three, one more. On the spot. Hold, pump, pump, pump. Four, three, we're going to the left. One, two, three. One, two, three, same feet. All right, your hitchhike, thumbs up. Nice, bigger arms. Careful if you have shoulder issues. Four, three. Two, one, and center, march. Nice work, guys. Dancing. Really important. Everybody know how to cha-cha? No? All right, it's easy. Here we go. Forward, back. One, two, cha-cha-cha. Forward, back. Cha-cha-cha. One, two, cha-cha-cha. Nice. Use your shoulders. Use your hips. Nice work. If you want, take it to the side. Take it to the side. Cross it over. Yeah, lovely. Four, three, two, one. Center back and forth. One, two, cha-cha-cha. One, two, cha-cha-cha. Hold and pump. Okay, everybody knows how to, how, how to dribble a basketball. Dribble, 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 Right arm, left arm, work it up, work it up. Four, three, two, and shoot that ball. Shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> the music is going in her head. Three, two, one, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. <gasps> nice work, you guys. Nice deep inhalation. And exhale. And inhale. And exhale. And last one. And give yourselves a really good hand because you were great. Thank you. <laughs> so that was exhilarating. So we're going to get on with our show here. So, um... This will be further discussed either in our networking and social evening tonight. Maybe we'll even get up and dance again. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but
But uh, anyway, just catching my breath here. So our next up to talk is Maureen Shields, and she is actually one of our local pharmacists. And um, so Maureen is here to talk to us about the O and, no, she's here to talk to us about the B and the O. So the B means vaccinate and the O means optimize meds. So a pharmacist is oftentimes one of those community liaisons that liaises between the medical community and, um, and, and end users. So Maureen, can you talk to us a little bit about vaccinations and optimization of meds? Hello. Um, okay, so I am out of breath. Thank you very much for making me follow that. <laughs> Um, okay, we'll start with vaccinations. Now, it's flu season, and I actually managed to leave my store for an hour to come here, so that's exciting. I've left someone there that can't vaccinate, so please don't run over to Pharmacy right now. Um, flu season brings out the people that want to get vaccinated, and people need to remember that, yes, you can go to your doctors. Some, some of the doctors have clinics. Some of the doctors, I'm not positive, will do walk-in health unit. Um, Healthier You does it every year. There's some employers will also have people come in and do vaccinations, which I actually did at a, at a place this morning. Um, but people have to remember that they also can, can get them done at most pharmacies, most if not all pharmacies in this city anyway. And some, some need you to book an appointment, others don't. So work with your own pharmacist and make sure that you do consider that. When you're vaccinating, flus aren't, flus aren't the only thing. Um, the standard ones that we look at for, for people, for adults, um, influenza annually, tetanus um, every 10 years, and um, then there's the shingles vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine. Now the pneumonia vaccine, um, it is publicly funded at, at 65. Shingles, they recommend it at 50. Unfortunately, I have seen very, it's certainly not publicly funded, it's expensive, but it's like insurance for anything else. Um, shingles can can be devastating, so you're dropping, I think it's about 160 or $170 an injection, and you need two of them. So three, $350 out of your pocket, if that can prevent a shingles outbreak, then I think it would probably be very well worth it. So have, have that discussion with your healthcare provider. Um, realize that you can actually have that discussion with your, your pharmacist as well, and um, go from there. So yes, vaccination. Optimizing medication. You, going to have to tell me how much time I have. Okay, well, you have about another four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. So Med reviews. <laughs> know what you're taking. That is, it, it's something that I, I always get frustrated when I see people that are given medication. And, and everyone in this room is probably familiar with the words polypharmacy and the words deprescribing. There are so many people that have so many medications that may or may not be what they need. Um, there's multiple prescribers. We get overlap. If, if, you, if you go to a single pharmacy and they know you, um, that's certainly something I would recommend because you, you build that relationship. The pharmacist is another one of your healthcare team. Um, when you're going to walk-in clinics, the walk-in clinic may not know you just like your family doctor does. So it's the same sort of thing, having, having that relationship. We have a, a very big advantage medication-wise in this province, which I've found is apparently not available in all provinces, but we have a province-wide network. When you go to a pharmacy in anywhere in this province, that pharmacist will see what you got at, I don't know, at, at, at this pharmacy in Poos Coopy, if that's where you picked up something six months ago. The pharmacist you're standing in Prince George will see that. So we have that advantage, but you also have to have, have that responsibility for your own own um, health care as well. You need, to, you need to know what you're taking, and if you don't know, you need to ask. And that's where you can get medication reviews with your pharmacist, and those are publicly funded as well, so certainly something worth, worth considering. But then there's that, that piece about the honesty and, and, and the communication, and this is, this is something I wanted to share. I spoke to Rita about it not long ago, and, and she said, oh, tell, tell everybody about this. And it, it's something, I know there's prescribers in this room, there's, there's probably patients as well, or pharmacists. I, I'm not sure the entire population in this room, but I know you've probably had some kind of interaction with, with patients that truly didn't tell you the whole story. And I think specifically, and I've had this happen just, just a few weeks ago, a gentleman comes in, he's got a new prescription for his blood pressure medicine, some Ramipril, and the doctors increased it to 10 milligrams a day. 
you would think, okay, not a big deal. Except I said, you used to be on five milligram, but you haven't been taking it for the last three months, have you? He goes, well, well, no. But my blood pressure's really high, so the doctor wanted to double it. And I said, the doctor didn't double it. You never told the doctor you haven't been taking it, did you? Well, well, no, but, you know, it's high, so he's giving me a stronger one. I said, whoa, 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 mister. You need to have that conversation with your prescriber. And sometimes the prescribers have to realize that sometimes these people aren't telling you the whole truth because they have that... It's a fear. I, mean, I know I'm supposed to take my blood pressure medicine, and I didn't. For the last three months, well, I threw it away, I forgot it. But I don't want to admit to that because now, now it's going to be my fault that I have the blood pressure problem. I'll just take the stronger pill. So as pharmacists, we end up seeing some of this stuff and having to advocate for those clients. You know, no, we need to talk to your doctor about that because it doesn't make sense to double it when really you've just quadrupled it because he's been taking nothing. So, you know, I thank you for that honesty and sharing, Maureen. And, you know, I mean, it is important to be having these conversations and, and finding the means to start conversations in our communities, in our regions, um, to, you know, not only with us as end users, but with our clinicians and physicians out there and to feel that, you know, I mean, as a patient partner, I feel empowered to talk to my physician about the things I need to talk to because I know that that is my right, but I know that not everybody knows that. And so, you know, just to empower our and educate our end users that, you know, they do have a say in it too, and, and our doctors should be open to talking about that, and they probably would if they were asked. So, you know, I, I thank you for that, Maureen. And um, d have you run across any humorous stories around medications or anything out there in your field of work? That I could share in public? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the mild case. I, I can't think of anything particularly humorous off the, off the cuff. I still remember the people out telling me when they wanted needles that they were using pork and bean insulin. But that was, that was many years ago, so that's what's kind of coming into my brain right now. Um, but there's, there's, always, there's always something. Um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, um, and it was talking about frailty, I mean, it's, it's great that we can, um, the, there's measurements for these kind of things, but one of the earlier speakers talked about the possibility of pharmacies um, doing testing devices for the public, similar to blood pressure machines, but like hand grips and gait speeds and that sort of thing. Um, do you see um, pharmacies maybe be willing to collaborate and, and help out the public with these kind of things? Do you think that's possible? Well, I mean, I think blood pressure machines in pharmacies is, is almost passe now. They all have them. Um, I haven't seen what you're suggesting. Is it a possibility if the, if the technology is there? There's always a possibility and the need. Okay, well, that, that's wonderful, and it's good to know that, you know, our community pharmacies are on board with considering these new kind of devices. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling really honored with the Canadian Frailty Network, you know, opening up and doing this first stop over in Western Canada and giving us the option here to get to know who each other is out in the region. I just recently had a meeting with people in Prince George that I didn't know them, and, you know, we get to meet with like-minded thinkers across the province, across the region, across the country. So I just feel very honored to be amongst those first pioneers. So um, with that, we'll, Maureen, I thank you very much for sharing. And with that, we'll go on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is um, John Brink. And John has been a um, well-known business person in this community almost forever. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, I actually got to through the aging with attitude thing, I got to know John. I kind of think of him as a poster child. And, um, you know, I got to talk to him about many things. And he's going to talk about um, the I and the D, which means the importance of, um, of interaction and avoiding social isolation. But he's also going to talk about diet and nutrition. And he can probably talk about that from his own perspective. And I just want to back up a little bit. John has brought his, some of his assistants here. Um, Scott McWalter is somewhere in this room, I know, and he was the one I went through. So Scott is around, and, and also the Brink group of companies, um, videographers here. So he's, Brady is out in the back there, and they're taping this, or they're recording this little session here. So um, 
there's signs all over the place that there's going to be there's things being recorded so i i'm assuming most of you are probably comfortable you know being shown maybe on social media or live streamed somewhere so with that john um start off with maybe the importance of interaction and the importance of diet and nutrition talk about your own personal story of how you got sick a while ago and were a little concerned about things and um, how you changed your lifestyle well thank you rita and uh, uh thank you everybody and it's, it's great to be here after the exercise that we had i need a, i need a nap for a little bit so not really but uh you know, I think uh, it is great and uh, have the opportunity to share with you some of my experience in regards to uh, healthy lifestyles and healthier living. Uh, I, uh, it, that, uh, I always say, you know, joining the gym is the easiest thing in the world to do because we've done it so often, usually right after New Year's, and then we stop all again a month later. At least I have done that many times. And then... There was a warning in, in, uh, in uh, June of 19, uh, 2008, uh, I got a case of diverticulitis. I didn't even know what it was. I'd never even heard of it. I could barely speak or, or say the words. And uh, it was a ruptured uh, uh, diverticulitis. It was, uh, I have a fairly high threshold for pain. So when it occurred on a Saturday afternoon, I found out later, uh, I... Uh, Stayed in bed, I was in Victoria, I stayed in bed all day on Sunday, which I never do, and then made my way back to Prince George because I have to work. And uh, on the plane, I barely made it on the plane. I had to hang on to the rails on the, on the aisles, uh, on the, uh, towards the gate, sea gates in Vancouver, because as soon as I would go on, from the pain, as soon as I would go on my knees, Somebody would call the hospital or the ambulances, and I'd be stuck in Vancouver. I came to Prince George. I, uh, uh, now it was already, and for those of you that are in the medical profession, uh, 48 hours after a ruptured uh, uh, colon uh, is the critical stage. I, I uh, went to my doctor who said, what are you doing here? Go to the hospital. I went to the hospital that evening. I got uh, an operation. And uh, the doc uh, later said to me, I came that close, you know, to uh, being too late. Uh, it, it kind of triggered me into maybe I should take a good look at my lifestyle. Uh, and uh, I, I was somewhat overweight. I'm, I maybe didn't eat as well, uh, as, as good at nutrition as I could and should. And I should join a gym. Now, as Rita already alluded to, uh, 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 Actually, I had a birthday about uh, two days ago, November the 1st. I turned 79. So, uh, the, uh, so uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, I should jo join the gym. So, I was 68 and uh, overweight, very conscientious about going to the gym because all these people looked like, you know, they were in so good shape and, and I obviously was marginal. But I knew one thing that I had to do because I have a number of businesses, about six in town, that do all kinds of things, and I run usually from meetings to meetings. So I had to get a trainer so that it creates an appointment. I must go. I live by appointment. So that's what I did. I got a trainer uh, and started uh, in 2008 and, uh, and, and stayed uh, in, uh, doing exercise or going to the gym uh, about five days a week at a minimum and do six to ten hours a week uh, in the gym. So after the first three years or four years, uh, somebody and five years and then so the people used to say, oh, you look good. And, uh, and I, I didn't feel that way, but then I, I, my body started to change. And this was not going to the gym and just kind of, you know, run around and talk a lot. And no, this was hard work. You know, I went to the gym and I wanted to just kind of put everything into it. So I did that, and then, uh, you know, and, uh, and a number of years later, they said to me, why don't you compete? Compete? You know, so, uh, and, and I did that. So I started competing in, in, in Prince George, actually, and, uh, you know, bodybuilding and physique. And, uh, you know, and, and, and all my friends in the audience and I was standing there in my little Speedos uh, up on stage. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> doing poses like... Uh, <laughs> anyway, I came in second in bodybuilding wow. and third in physique, which qualified me for the provincials. So that was a whole different scene because there you got hundreds of people and, 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 and now it's getting to become serious because let me assure you that if somebody competes at the provincial level, these are athletes. And, and I kind of felt out of place, but then people said, oh, you look good. And, and I didn't even tell them about it, my age. <laughs> but in any event, I, I then competed in my category again, and I came in third in physique and, uh, and again second in bodybuilding. It's qualified me for the nationals. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a national level bodybuilder. In fact, it also qualified me for the Arnolds. And, uh, and so, uh, since the time I, I had some injuries and, uh, uh, and, and I have been off for a number of months, but I will be going back to the gym uh, in the next month. And my objective is to again compete when I'm 80 uh, on the smaller level first, then go to the uh, provincials and again qualify for the nationals. And I'm bound and determined to do that. This would make me the oldest competitive bodybuilding in the province. And I'm going to win. So the message that I have for you is what did it do for me? Well, obviously I'm in good shape. I, I was going to actually propose that we do uh, 20 push-ups, all of us. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> so it makes me go to the gym. I need a goal and an objective. That's why and I need a trainer, so, and then as I go there, then we, we go all out very structured, making sure, you know, that uh, I follow the routine and do all those things. The other part about it, which is very important, if you want to be successful, and I'm not suggesting that we all should go and compete on a national level, I'm simply saying, go to the gym, do exercise, stay physically fit, and the other thing that it does for you is you become more aware of nutrition and the things that are good for you and the ones that are not. And, and again, that is the other part of my message to you is healthy lifestyles is very important and, uh, and, and, and feeling positive and feeling that uh, you have things to contribute. Even, I, I know people as you do that uh, unfortunately already at 45 they have decided they are too old. Are you gonna do this? There is, no, I'm too old. And, and, and I say at nearly 80 that I'm running six companies. We employ about 400 people. I, uh, today, uh, uh, Brody's in the back there doing the videos, and then we had Scott in here. And they run behind me virtually every day of the week because we're so busy doing so many things all at the same time. Everything is possible. But stay positive in your mindset. Eat healthy. Uh, go to the gym, keep physically active. The other thing that I do is my wife, myself, I saw Chuck Diego here, he's sitting down there. I know his wife, Mary, uh, a friend of ours, and uh, you know, they, they are into horses. We are too. We have uh, a farm in North Saanich, actually, and 50 acres, and we, we, my wife, myself, have 10 horses. We both ride uh, dressage, English dressage, and, and that keeps us active and healthy as well. At the same time, what I do, and I'm telling you these things simply saying you don't have to do all the things that I do, but I do them because it keeps me healthy, it keeps me mentally active, and, and, and I'm active and I enjoy every day when I get up. I usually wake up at 5.30, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry because I always think I'm late. But the one thing that I always do before I get up, I make my bed. I always do that. <laughs> you know, so that if I come back in the evening, you know, which I usually work 12 hours a day, when I come back, I go for dinner, and then I go into the bedroom and I say, oh my God, there's my bed. <laughs> you know, so, and, and that kind of a habit. The other thing that uh, uh, I'm active in is, uh, you know, the, uh, I have a bike, in, uh, both in uh, bike meaning, I also have a motorbike. I actually have a Harley Davidson. I took my wife, I took, Two years before my wife found out that I had a Harley Davis, somebody <laughs> put a picture on, on, uh, on Facebook that uh, was uh, posing uh, with my Harley Davis. She said, what is that? 
Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> He's so naughty, Dave. <laughs> I forgot to mention it to you. Yeah, right. You know, so anyway, I don't recommend that necessarily to anybody, but, uh, but, but I have the, the riding bikes. And, uh, and, and when I'm in uh, North Sanders, I usually ride about 20 Ks a weekend, at least every day that I'm there. And the same here, I have a bike. And, uh, you know, so, and, and then I walk, uh, you know, uh, by uh, the Nechaco River into the a, a routine that I have somewhat and just to stay active. My message to you is that a healthy lifestyle, stay mentally fit, uh, you know, be involved in, in, in the society. We are very, I'm very active in the community. Join, uh, uh, if, if you have difficulty doing it on your own, join a, a health group like the Y or so many other places that we have here. Find friends that have similar interests as you do, and then uh, follow, become knowledgeable about diets, and then there are some logical things that you should follow. Uh, obviously, if it's is a given, don't smoke. It's, it's not good for you. Don't drink excessively, and, 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 and eat balanced meals. And then, at the same time, believe in yourself in terms of Age is just, it honestly, is truly just a number. And, uh, and, and I believe still at, at 80 that uh, in, in the company life that I have and where I am active, I, we still intend to grow, we still very, very active. I'm going to go to the gym. You know, the other thing that I'm doing is I'm working on my commercial pilot's license. Be, I tell tongue and cheek to other people, uh, I'm going to get uh, Fly for West yet. I know, I simply do it because uh, I, I like that and it gives me an opportunity to stay busy uh, on the weekends. And so, the story is simply, there's so much that we have and so much that, 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 where there are opportunities, especially in British Columbia. And, and it, it, I enjoy being alive, I'm enjoying being nearly 80, and I intend to do lots more and, and I'm always excited about the things around me. Be happy, be friendly and that gives you so much more opportunity to have a healthy lifestyle. Well, thank you, John. <laughs>